Buckle up, boys. Time to go to work. Welcome to the Dan Patrick Show. Give me a chance here. Go in, soak it up. Bringing Sal Palantonio, ESPN's national correspondent. Bringing you the biggest guests and best interviews. I said, give me two teams that are going to surprise being better, two teams that will surprise by being worse than what we think. All right, let's go with the Pittsburgh Steelers. They have Mika Fitzpatrick, Defensive Player of the Year candidate, without a doubt. They're going to make the playoffs in Pittsburgh. I think the Jets are a team that could put it all together very quickly under Sam Darnold. I think worse than we think. I'm going to go with Arizona Cardinals will get worse. I think the Houston Texans. I think the Houston Texans will take a step back. Broadcasting from the Mercedes Man Cave, this is Dan Patrick. Oh, that's right. Show started. <laughs> I'm over there talking to Paulie. We're talking about last night, the last dance. Oh, and I hear the music, and I hear, and Dan Patrick. And I go, hmm, that's me. Well, welcome to the program. Hope you had a great weekend, everybody. And a belated happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that I didn't get to reach out to yesterday. And hopefully you got the uh, Dan Patrick Show uh, Mother's Day card that we sent out. It's a picture of myself and my mom. And Mario did a wonderful job with that. So I uh, want to thank him for doing that. It was nice to uh, remember my mom. All right. Best and worst of the weekend, as we always do every Monday. What you liked, what you didn't like. 877-3DP-SHOW. Email address, dp at danpatrick.com. Twitter handle at DP Show. We have a poll question, a couple of stats of the day. We got a play of the day as well. But we begin with the last dance. It's been interesting. But there was something unique about the seventh episode, which aired on ESPN last night. And maybe this was the truest view of Michael Jordan that we've ever seen as a competitor. You watched him give his teammates grief. Opponents, they got grief as well. You got Michael, current day Michael, getting emotional looking back. And he said, and the quote was, winning has a price and leadership has a price. Now we can get into breaking it down of, is that really leadership? You know, you got the results. We always look at the bottom line, winning. He won. We don't really care how you got there. He won. Michael won. But there's personal relationships. And you could see this was the not nice Michael Jordan. He would do anything to win. And the results were six titles. All great athletes are competitive, and he took it as far as anyone I've ever known. He expected a lot out of his teammates. But Jordan also said that he never asked them to do something that he wouldn't do himself. And that's why it's hard to critique his style. Jordan was tough to play with. He was tough to play against. But the rewards were often as good as it gets. And you're just getting a full picture. This is Michael Jordan in full. You're getting to see, and tr it's not a true documentary. We've discussed that. He gets the final say. It's his team that put this together along with ESPN. And ESPN has done a wonderful job. But Mike is going to let you see what he wants you to see. And he let... He, he gave that window into the relationship with his father and how he was to his teammates. Now, a lot of this stuff is not new to me because I, I, I saw it or was told this by members of the Bulls. But you were sworn to secrecy. I can't tell you how nervous the former players were about Mike hearing about this. And retribution comes in all different forms with Michael Jordan. They would say, you can't tell anybody, but. I remember the first time I heard about the Steve Kerr punch. And one of his former teammates was saying, yeah, we, we didn't know how to cover it up. So this didn't get out that Michael punched Steve Kerr. And somebody said, you know, we were talking about, we joked about makeup, putting makeup on his uh, black eye. Like, there was stuff that came out. But back then, you know, Michael, he had a tight ship. And if it got out, he would pretty much know where it came from. The Chicago media was there, you know, omnipresent. Everybody was looking for something. But they were in his corner in how they covered Michael Jordan. There were things that Michael was accused of, involved in, 
Off the court, we know about a lot of this stuff. But back then, nobody knew about it. Very few people knew about it. And if you were trusted, you know, they you would get information. And it's almost as if somebody wanted to see if they could trust you about this. Because they, they could talk amongst each other. But after a while, they wanted others to know what exactly this is like. I remember when one of the former players talked about getting the look. And I said, what's the look? He goes, you don't want the look. I said, what do you mean? That means Jordan is really mad at you, and he's your teammate, and he doesn't want to throw you the ball because he doesn't trust you. I said, oh. And then after that, I would start looking for the look on the court. If somebody missed one or two jumpers, Mike was not going to throw you the ball. He would be mad at you on the floor. You got the look. But it's fascinating. And there were other things with Scottie Pippen. Scottie Pippen didn't have a good weekend. He did not. Now, the first couple of weeks, we felt sorry for Scottie Pippen. Like, oh, man, he didn't get paid. And, you know, without Michael or without Scottie, Michael doesn't win six titles, doesn't come close. He's acknowledged Scottie being great. Scottie with a great story out of nowhere. Central Arkansas goes to the Bulls and becomes one of the 50 greatest players of all time. There is the moment on Scottie Pippen saying he wasn't going back into the game when Phil Jackson designed a play for Tony Kukoc. Now, you would think if you asked Scotty, if you had to do it all over again, he would say something along the lines of, yeah, I wouldn't have done it the way I did. Nope. Here's Scotty Pippen. I felt like it was an insult uh, coming from Phil. I was the most dangerous guy on our team. So why are you asking me to take the ball out? This is a season where he's taken the, the role of Michael. He's had this MVP caliber season. He thought it should be him taking the shot. And so Jim Clemens came over and said, Scotty's not going in. And Phil said, what do you mean he's not going in? And I go down and I said, are you in or out? And he said, I'm out. That's Dennis Rodman in there. And when you realize Scotty was sitting out, and at, at the time we thought, well, may, did he get hurt? Like, what happened here? And Phil designed a play for Tony Kukoc. Scotty said he would still sit out because, you know, he took it as a slight. All right. That's not a, that, that, that wasn't a good answer by Scotty. I mean, he could have said, you know, at the time I felt like, boy, I'm, I'm now your Michael. I want the ball. Mike got the ball in those situations. And I'm thinking Scotty's probably in his mind going, I earned this. Like, this is my moment where people look at me differently than, oh, yeah, you're Robin to Batman. I understand all of that. But you're going against Phil Jackson and what he thinks is going to work with Tony Kukoc, who was a very polished scorer. And it worked. But for Scotty to say that now, it doesn't sound like he's evolved at all with this. Matured with this. Yeah, Paul. The video from last night is so good. Once you know the backstory, and then you, they play the scene of the bench where Scotty Pippen, when the huddle breaks... He goes to the end of the bench where all the scrubs are and sits down. And one of the assistant coaches is talking to him and he's yelling and about I'm upset about something. You can't read his lips. But there's a bench player. Remember Scott Williams? Was it out of North Carolina? North Carolina. He's right there and he just turns around and he does this monstrous eye roll, like, oh boy. And then you just see Phil Jackson run down there. And to see it play out after you know the story is really interesting. There were a couple other things. Um, you know, Michael created these slights. Most of them were not real. Some were, you know, the bad boys, that was real. But you could tell that on the court. The other stuff, Michael was just looking. Imagine trying to get up every single night. Because Michael, people were there to see Michael. And I can't imagine the, the mental toll that takes on you. Physically, obviously. But mentally, he wanted to be great every single night. How do I become great every night? You know, if it's a musician, if it's an athlete, whatever it is, every single night, you got to be great. And Michael created slights. Here's one that Ahmad Rashad talked about. The Seattle Supersonics coach, George Carl, didn't talk to Michael. This is courtesy of The Last Dance on ESPN. During the finals, we go out to dinner one night. George Carl's over on the other side having dinner. Hey, there's George Carl over there. And George Carl does not come over and speak to him. He walked right past me. And I look at him, I said, really? Oh, so that's how you're going to play it. You know, he just kind of went by, and I went, uh-oh. Should have never done that. I said, it's a crock of 
you know, we went to Carolina. We know Dean Smith. You got to see him in the summer. We play golf. You going to do this? Okay, fine. That's all I needed. That's all I needed for him to do that. And it, it became personal with me. <laughs> As if winning a title is not motivation enough, Mike needed even more motivation. Gary Payton, the glove, former defensive player of the year, <laughs> he did not back down to Michael Jordan. And he talked about his style of roughing up, trying to be physical with Michael Jordan. Uh, Michael Jordan had a response to Gary Payton not backing down to MJ. A lot of people back down the bike. I didn't. I made it a point. I said, just tire him out. You just got to tire him out. And I kept hitting him and banging him and hitting him and banging him. It took a toll on Mike. It took a toll. And then I feel so <laughs> resting him a little bit and then the, the, the series changed and I wish I could have did it earlier I don't know if the outcome would have been different but it, it, it was a difference <laughs> with me and, and beating him down a little bit the glove I had no problem with the glove I had no problem with Gary Payton I had a lot of other things on my mind <laughs> now that's Jordan laughing he's looking at an iPad there of Gary Payton's comments now, there's one thing I take away from this that it, it feels like it's always there every episode. Mike doesn't give credit to too many people. He'll give credit to Scotty. He'll give credit to Phil. But Michael's still competing. He, does, he needed to give a little bit more of an acknowledgement to Gary Payton. Because if you look at the three games that Gary Payton guarded Michael Jordan in those NBA Finals, two of Mike's worst playoff performances ever. Or against Gary Payton. Gary Payton deserved credit last night. Not laughing. Not laughing. I thought that was BS. Give him credit. Y you get the feeling that it was Scotty and Michael and nobody else gets any credit or deserves any credit here. We know Jerry Krause doesn't get any credit. But, you know, acknowledge. Gary Payton deserved that. He's one of the great, you know, Hall of Famer. He's one of the great players. Two-way players. And he did not back down to Michael Jordan. You know, the game is over, Mike. You won. <laughs> you, you won. You won them all, Mike. There's no fifth quarter here. There's no overtime. You won. It's okay to go, you know what? Hey, I was tough on my teammates. You know, that's how I led. Okay. Uh, tough on the opposition. Okay. But respect? Gary Payton didn't walk off the court like the bad boys and not shake your hand. And poor LeBradford Smith, who probably was watching, going, wait, they just mentioned me. What did I do? The fact that he created this grudge against LeBradford Smith of the Washington Bullets because he said, nice game, Mike, <laughs> instead of saying, oh, my God, Mike, you're unbelievable. You're incredible. He, he said, nice game. Oh. <sighs> I just can't imagine how tiring it must have been to be around Michael. So competitive, always on you. If you beat him at something, he had to, he had to go again. I, I, I think there was a story with the Dream Team. Chuck Daly beat him in golf. And Michael was demanding that they play 18 holes. You know, he wanted another shot at Chuck Daly, the coach. That competition, and if you've been around somebody who is highly competitive... It gets to be tiring. But look, his leadership back then, we admired, we acknowledge. Nowadays, if you were trying to get away with a lot of this stuff, imagine if LeBron, I know it always comes back to LeBron, but I think LeBron is unfairly criticized. I think he's the most critique athlete in history. He hadn't done anything wrong. Remember, he said he was taking his talents to South Beach. Kobe invented that phrase. Kobe, at his press conference, when he was leaving high school, says, "I'm with sunglasses on his head, said, I'm taking my talents to the NBA. LeBron says, can you believe that? Taking his talents to... Imagine if the story came out that LeBron said, Kevin Love doesn't get to eat after a bad game. <laughs> okay? Just imagine that. How many weeks would we spend on that? 
or those who are sycophants of Jordan and don't like LeBron James. You know, well, look at LeBron bullying Kevin Love. I mean, Mike did that to Horace Grant. Didn't let him eat. I mean, that's just one little story. If LeBron punched Kyrie Irving, I mean, let it, let it settle in here. I know Mike's the, the GOAT. Absolutely. But we let him get away with everything. We don't let LeBron get away with anything. Michael Jordan has become Babe Ruth. We allow Babe Ruth to get away with everything. Hey, you went out on your wife. You drank all the time. You ate. You're a pig. You blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but the man, he called shot. Man, 700 home runs. Bryce Harper's hair is too long. Just spend a couple of days on I mean, come on. We can't pick and choose with this, and we've done that with Jordan. We, we pick and choose, or LeBron. Mike, everything about this, awesome. Hey, whatever he does, he's awesome. Here's your numbers with Gary Payton, and this is why it did bother me with the belly laugh that Mike had. 1996 NBA Finals versus Seattle. Games 1, 2, and 3... Michael averaged 31 and shot 46% from the floor. Games four, five, and six, when Gary Payton guarded him, Michael averaged under 24 and shot 36% from the floor. That's not a belly laugh. That's not. Just acknowledge somebody might have gotten the better of you occasionally, Mike. This program brought to you by LegalZoom. No matter what happens, you want to make sure your loved ones are taken care of. That's why LegalZoom has made it easy to set up the right estate plan without leaving your home. Take care of your family today. The right estate plan at LegalZoom.com. And I acknowledge Jordan's greatness. People misread this. I'm just honest with this. I give you the facts. I, I'm not drunk with Jordan stories and stats and greatness. He is spectacular. But I have to look at this and be fair to the story. We acknowledge greatness when you win. I don't care how you got there. We acknowledge greatness. That's it. Bottom line, greatness. I just think that we, we pick and choose. And certainly with LeBron James. And LeBron James doesn't need for me to stick up for him. But I do want to present the facts that I was there covering Jordan. And I've been there covering LeBron. LeBron went to the finals that first time. And I was there covering that. Like I've been there with these superstars. And you don't have to compare them if you don't want to. And maybe we shouldn't compare until LeBron's all done. And if you still want Michael to be better than LeBron, good for you. When you fall in love, that first love, and you, you stay with that. And that's what happened with Michael Jordan. For an entire generation, nobody could compete with Michael Jordan. We wouldn't allow it. Kobe, closest we've ever seen, we didn't even allow him in the conversation. And we should have, because Kobe was my, if, if Kobe came before Michael, we would be talking about Kobe. Mike was the first man on the moon, as I've told you. He's Neil Armstrong. There's never going to be somebody who got there before you. We've had Dr. J, we've had Wilt, we've had Bill Russell, we've had Magic, we've had, we've had all of these great players. Michael did it all. He was a brand, became a billionaire. He won. Even the baseball part, that's why I applaud Tim Tebow. When you have status, now it's, it's much lesser for Tim Tebow. Michael is the greatest athlete. He, you know, the sport has ever seen. Greatest player ever seen. Whatever you want to, you know, your, your verbal bouquets, pile them on. The fact that he would risk that reputation to go to play the hardest sport there is to play, and that is baseball. I applaud it. Now, Michael didn't have a good swing. It was a long swing, but he had athleticism. He hadn't played baseball in, in 12 years. And they put him in double A. And then he realized, as I realized when I was playing baseball, that damn curveball is just not fair. And Mike was great until they threw nothing but curveballs. But he did play. And, and he played at a pretty good level. And that's what I, I applaud that. If you truly wanted to do that and you wanted to, you know, do it for your father, then God bless you. And if it had nothing to do with gambling, 
Good. I hope it doesn't. I hope it didn't. But I applaud him for doing that. And he wanted to be great at baseball. And he was serviceable. And that's saying an awful lot. It really is. All right, we'll get to your phone calls. 877-3DP-SHOW. Email address dp at danpatrick.com. You can watch on youtube.com slash the Dan Patrick Show. And you can listen on the 362 radio affiliates around the country. 20 after the hour, we'll come back on the Dan Patrick Show. By the way, Reggie Miller will join us and Phil Mickelson stopping by. Just getting started here on the Dan Patrick Show. Discover makes it quick and easy. Best of all, it's free. I got your attention with that free stuff, huh? How about checking your credit? Free. Discover is offering FICO credit scores, the score used by 90% of top lenders, and it's free, even if you're not a customer. Checking your score won't hurt your credit, and you can check each month for changes. The Discover credit scorecard, free for everyone. You can learn more at discover.com slash credit scorecard. Once again, Discover credit scorecard, free for everyone. Even if you're not a customer, learn more. Discover.com slash credit scorecard. Limitations apply. I'd rather have a beer with or who not you, have who would you least want to have a beer with Mar- uh, marcus mariota already won the poll actually oh he did <laughs> yeah <laughs> nobody wants to have a beer with that dude come on uh i'd probably say kyler murray because chances yeah. are we probably aren't going to be talking too much oh. <laughs> oh, i'm going to no. ask a lot of questions he'll look around to see if his dad will allow him to answer now i have to take kyler murray and his dad out so i got to pick up the tab for two people what about eli eli would be fun See, he comes off as boring, you know, on press conferences and stuff, but he's he'd be fun to have a beer with. I remember having beers with Eli and Peyton in New Orleans. This is after his senior year at uh, Ole Miss. He's entertaining. When he's around Peyton, he's really entertaining because he feels comfortable. And, and Peyton is a great storyteller. Okay, Cousins or Flacco? You have to have a beer with Kirk one Kirk D. Cousins or Joe Flacco? Yes, Tom. I think you got to go Cousins, even though it's uh, I, I love my Broncos. But Cousins came on the show and he sang. He was willing to put himself out there embarrassingly. He, he seems like he might be a little more sociable and will be willing to be a little silly. Yeah, but that was when he was in college. Different. I, he's driving around a minivan with seven kids he, as we speak at all times. He is Mr. Family Guy. Oh, let me see. I'm going to go Flacco. I'm going to I'm going to because I'm hoping that he'll tell me stories about the Ravens. Flacco's done one funny interview in the history of the world. It was with you <laughs> after the Super Bowl. You happened to catch him relax. <laughs> who else would be on that list? Okay, if you just had, who would you rather have beers with? I think Ryan Fitzpatrick, if he wins a starting job, is an interesting have beers with guy. You think he'd be fun? He'd either be real fun or not fun at all. <laughs> okay. I don't know if there would be any in between. Harvard, but he's got a big beard and he looks like he's on Duck Dynasty. Yeah. Yeah, Paul. Goff's a bro. He would have some beers. He'd have some good talk. I don't know if Russell Wilson Jr. the third would be a ball of fun. Nah. He's not going out for beers. He's got to bring Sierra. That's in the. Yes. That changes. If he brings Sierra, then okay. If you add in significant others, that changes the poll completely. Tom Tom Brady's fun, right? You've had a beer with him. Yeah. Yeah. Brady would be fun. You know who I uh, think? Baker Mayfield? See, I don't know if he'd be as fun as you think he is. I saw him at a Super Bowl party, and he was quiet and well-behaved. Well, he needs to. I mean, you know, the public perception, you know, you're running from the law. You know, that, that you know, people still have that image, and they want to see if you're drinking, how heavily you're drinking. But, yeah, he might be a little more guarded now. Who else, McLean? Uh, Mahomes seems like. What's you, up, Mahomes? I don't know. It's, he's got to get a beer or it's, He's like more like hang out, play golf with. He seems obsessed with golf. Um, It'd be a lot more fun than you think. All mm-hmm. right. Thank you, Todd. 
Thank you, Todd. Okay, a couple more quarterbacks <laughs> to have beers with. I'll give you Stafford, Rodgers, or Trubisky, the NFC North. Uh, I'd go Rodgers. Stafford, though, you know. Stafford would be a bro guy. He's a yeah, nice he, guy. You know, hat backwards guy. I, I think Luck. Now, I've been, at, I've been out socially with Luck. Or um, with uh, Rogers, and I and I think he's he can be sneaky, funny. He's snarky, but it's there's always an interesting conversation going on. There's the you know he got a lot of opinions and and uh, but he's you know, not afraid to jab a little bit. So okay, I, Rogers would be fun. I do the NFC South last one. Our buddy Matt Ryan, who we got a beer with uh, at Pebble, Drew Brees, Cam Newton, or Jameis Winston. I don't know Jameis Winston. Ooh. Probably not. Not this. He's got to step it up. James, James shouldn't be having beers with anybody. Um, he might be the guy that I would just be curious. Like, how, how, I don't know how you tick. I don't know what goes on with you. Cam could be fun. To, he'd show up at the bar wearing something interesting, yeah, possibly. Yeah. He's probably got good stories. Matty Ice, Drew Breeze. Breeze might be, you know, looking at the bottle, seeing how many calories are in there. <laughs> he strikes me as, you know. Now, if you have Jimmy G with you, obviously, that brings a whole new element that you'll have sort of women floating around your table. As, uh, as long as he doesn't bring the porn star out like he did in Beverly Hills. As long as he doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I just I, want to clarify. Yeah, yeah he doesn't. That's something we think. Uh, we'll come up with a poll question. I got all fired up watching the Jordan documentary. McLovin, you got a poll question today? Yeah, it's going to make you mad again. <laughs> what, is it have to do with the greatest college basketball player of all time? No, no, no. Okay. Well, yes, in a way. Okay. What is the greatest NBA team of all time? You say, uh, we're showing the 96 Bulls last night. Is that the greatest team? And Yahoo had a list of the other great teams, the 2017 Warriors, the 86 Celtics, the 72 Lakers, the team that went on that long win streak. Uh, this is always tricky, you know, because – there's no right answer here. Um, do I go with playoff record? Do I go regular season record? You have to win the championship if you even if you, you had a great regular season. Like the Warriors had a great regular season when they won what 73 games. They didn't win the title that year. Uh, the '86 Celtics. That was a deep team. Bill Walton was sixth man of the year. That was Bird prime Bird Bird in '86. Um, they were a great defensive team too, which people would never think with the Celtics. They were they were the best offensive rated team. They were third in defense that year. The '96 Bulls were spectacular. Uh, the '72 Lakers, who I got to see, you know that was that was a, a really balanced team. And Wilt became a rebounder and a defensive player. He had a good backcourt there. Um, yeah, you you just can't. I mean the 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 Showtime Lakers were. I I know we get into oh you know the um, the Warriors now with Durant they would beat the Bulls in the night of the, the mid nineties like I to me it's fruitless to try to, to try that argument uh, it's just I'd rather enjoy what I saw because it's different now it's just the game is played differently if I put the Warriors of twenty seventeen back in the nineties you know Durant and Steph Curry would be beat up. They would, and JaVale McGee is your big man. They would be going, are you kidding me? That's your rim protector? You know, Shaq and Kobe. Whew. I'm just, I mean, as far as teammates go, that's pretty spectacular as well. So I, I'd rather not do that because I don't think there's an answer, a right answer in there. What else do you have? Okay, uh, does the last dance make Michael Jordan more likable or less <laughs> likable? And I was actually thinking of Seton's wife because she came with, Seton said last week that she's like, well, uh, this is a likable guy. Last night was an interesting test of that theory too. Well, I don't think Mike wanted to be likable. I, I don't think that was his goal. I, I think he- should accomplish. I, I think he wanted to be respected. Uh, admired, feared, but liked. I know that the, the, the commercial was you want to be like Mike, not you want to like Mike. Yeah, Seton. There's this moment, though, um, you know, I think maybe now looking back, 
Michael is a little different, it seems like, than in the moment in terms of wanting to be liked, because there was this one moment where he's talking in the interview and he says, like, you know, you know, looking back, if you want to say that I was mean or I was bad or whatever, but that's about you and not about me. And then he starts getting emotional and he's like tearing up and he's like, all right, got break. You know, and then that's how it ends. He's just like, oh, that's a break. You know, he wants to take a break from the interview. Um, I don't know. You know, maybe his perspective has changed a little bit. Maybe a little. But that's when I screamed at the TV when he said, no, let's take a break. I'm like, no, you want to make this a documentary? Give me the real moment here. I want Mike crying. I Like, I want to see behind the, the, the facade that's there. Pull the curtain back. Because it, it humanizes Jordan. And that's what you want in this. I mean, we've seen the tough guy creating rivalries that weren't there. I want to see that there's, we saw him so emotional about his father after he won the title. And that's such a raw piece of footage there. And we couldn't understand it. We still can't quite comprehend that. But I don't, I don't think Mike cares about being liked. He wants to be feared and he wants to be respected. And he wants to be admired. Yeah, Paul. As a Chicago sports fan, Michael Jordan was never liked by the fans. He was admired for his ability to what he delivered to us. Wins and wins every night. You can count on it. But he was never a beloved Chicago athlete, you know, like others. You know, Big Poppy is not the best Red Sox player of all time, but he's one of the most beloved Red Sox players. Like Bill Belichick's not beloved by sports fans in Boston, but he's admired because of what he does for you. Well, it's like A-Rod's not beloved. No. Jeter's beloved. A-Rod was a better player, but Jeter is beloved. There's certain players that you you separate them. And and Jordan's not in Chicago? No, it, it's different. See, it's like he was this he was a worldwide figure. He wasn't Chicago's own Michael Jordan. Maybe in the first few years he became this worldwide athlete. He was never Chicago's player, but he delivered Chicago relevancy which they didn't have. Basketball wise definitely never had relevancy basketball wise and the 85 Bears had that one year, but otherwise Chicago sports back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s was nothing but Mike. And so he wasn't beloved as much as he was admired as an icon. But why was Walter Payton beloved? Because he toiled through it for the Bears team and was hardworking, showed up every day, and he suffered. And, all, and he was a local athlete. He was not a worldwide athlete, in my opinion, as, as a Chicago Bears Bulls fan. But Michael's more like a, an icon, an untouchable icon. You wouldn't see Michael Jordan at a bar. You wouldn't see him at a restaurant in Chicago. Never. You'll never run into him on the street. Like, he was not that of that ilk. I remember when he opened up his, uh, his restaurant in Chicago, and we went in. We were covering the NBA Finals, and we thought, you know, let's go over. Maybe Michael will be there. And uh, so then I, I talked to the manager, and uh, he recognized me, and uh, he said, does Mike know you're here? And I go, no. And he goes, oh, then <laughs> never mind. <laughs> because <laughs> Michael was there and he had a private private dining room in there. And I thought, I, no, he d I should have said, uh, I, th I think he thinks we're kind of, you know, I'm, 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 maybe I'm late or maybe I'm like, I didn't even think on my feet about, you know, do I somehow sneak into a dinner there with uh, Michael Jordan? Uh, Doug in North Carolina. Doug, what's on your mind today? Well, Dan, specifically, I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is uh, obviously the hometown of Michael Jordan. And there's a lot of pride that he's from here, but there's also a great sense of personal rejection. It's the, the sense is that he's left town and never looked back. And like many cities, hmm. we have a local sports hall of fame. Roman Gabriel, Sonny Jurgensen, Trot Nixon have all been inducted. They refuse to induct Michael Jordan. It's just like what Polly was saying. He, he you never see him around town. He's kind of forgotten where he came from. Willie Stardrill, the, the Pirates great, mm -hmm. grew up in Florida, played you know elsewhere, died in Wilmington. He was inducted posthumously, but they will not induct Michael Jordan into this Hall of Fame. That's just a sense that he's not even loved in his hometown. All right, Doug. Well, thank you. I did not know that. Uh, Mean-spirited John in New Zealand joins us. Hey, John, what do you have for me today? <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you caught me out there, uh, Dan, <laughs> so with the mean-spirited. Um, I nearly called in last week to apologize to, to not to Paulie, but to Fritzy because he looked so disappointed in me when I watched it back on YouTube, the expression on his face, I felt so bad. Um, oh, when you Dan, made fun uh, of Paulie's dead dad? I'm, well, yeah, yeah, when 
when I did that. I you didn't feel bad for Paulie. You Fritzy. felt bad for Fritzy because... No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. All right, no, what's no, on your I mean, mind? Would be proud of me. What's on your mind, uh, John? Three quick, three, three quick sentences and then a question for All you. Right. Okay. Dan, um, I was watching the final dance, and uh, it reminded me of a famous Australian cricketer named Keith Miller. He was a two-way player, so he would pitch and he would bat, and he was and he was a fighter pilot in World War Two. And he was asked after he retired, how did he manage? pressure at the highest level of international sport. And he said, that's not pressure. Pressure is a messy schmidt up your ass. And he had the view that there is war and then there is sports. And I was watching uh, the final dance and I was wanting to ask you, who've been in this business for 30, 40 years, when did it become okay to treat people badly so long as you were winning? Thanks for the phone call, John. This information never got out. It was rare that anybody said anything about Michael, his teammates. You know, when it came out that he and Steve Kerr had an altercation and that Steve Kerr is the one who hit Michael first and then Michael hit him. But it it felt like it was cordoned off to the rest of America. It just, it's a different time now. If, If this happened now... By the time practice ended, maybe even not by the time practice ended, there would be somebody tweeting or a photo of this altercation or Steve Kerr's black eye. I mean, everything is public consumption now, and it's right away. We need it immediate. Back then, you just sort of admired, and, and I go back to Mickey Mantle. You just admired Mickey Mantle as a baseball player. He was flawed as a person, as we all are. You know, he, he, he was a drinker, partier, womanizer. But we just looked at athletes back then and, and just accepted them for that. I don't know when the consumption of an athlete off the court, off the field, took shape. You know, there, there's certain – like Muhammad Ali, it became about him out of the ring too. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, when he changed his name, you know, became then then they're people. We just viewed you as athletes. I didn't know anything about Wilt Chamberlain or Oscar Robertson or Pete Maravich off the court. I, I had no idea. But then, and I don't know. I, I probably would have to think about this of when we started to look at these athletes and say, "I want to know more," because this is on you, the audience. You consume it. You want to know. You want stories. People don't want to hear about somebody on the floor, on the court, on the baseball field. It's like, hey, what's he like off the what, – what's he really like? Hey, is he really that guy? Th- those are the questions I get. The public consumption. That's why you have all these magazines, these tabloid magazines. You want to know about George Clooney and his twins. You want to know about Brad Pitt. Is he? Da- I mean, it's your consumption of this that feeds the machine. Because if you didn't care about it, then these rags wouldn't exist. Yeah, Paul. I think on a national level when we started knowing more about athletes was when ESPN took over in the 80s, and guys like Roy Firestone did those in-depth interview shows. There was Sports coverage on a local level was very small back in the day. But once Roy Firestone started sitting down with an athlete— We're going to blame Roy. <laughs> maybe, or maybe, maybe credit him because, you know, for, for 30 minutes he sat down with athletes, and I know it's polished and it's produced, but it felt like you actually heard an athlete talk with more than a soundbite. No, and it's and Roy did such a great job on, on up close. And and if you're not familiar with that interview show, and and Roy was somebody that I admired and tried to follow in his footsteps of asking questions to get people to talk. And Roy would have athletes on, and he would have them talk about personal things. It wasn't just what you did third down, you know, in the fourth quarter. It it, it was, you know, who you were, your father. Uh, childhood, you know, it was more of a seeing an athlete in full, and and Roy opened the the window to that. But yeah, I don't I don't remember. I don't know what some of these guys were like at all, off the court. Now you would start to hear more. the The deeper I got into this business, and the more people I knew, the more stories you would hear, because there was this inner circle, this inner sanctum that said, uh, "Hey, did you hear about?" And and if I if I had a dollar for every time I was told, hey, do you hear about? I'd have a lot of dollars because 
there are, there's a lot of stories, but people are, they are people. You know, there's very few that I go, that guy is exactly who I thought he was. Dale Murphy of the Braves is exactly who you think he was and he is. He is pure, clean. He is a gentleman. He's everything. If my daughter brought home a Dale Murphy personality, I'd go, sign me up. I, 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 Dale Murphy was one of those people that you met and you went, he, that's who he is. There are guys who hide behind religion that I knew. And they would always say, and they would throw out a Bible quote, or they would, and then you'd realize that is that the same? Is that the same guy? So <laughs> like it, it's just you know we're we're people, you know we make mistakes, you know whether you talk about them or not. Uh, do you want to know about them? My brothers in law, big New York Giants fans, and I was covering the Giants back in the Lawrence Taylor days. All they want to know about is Lawrence Taylor off the field, and and they. And I say, I always say, you know, if I'm being fair to, you know, stories that are out there, I don't, you know, there's stuff that I just say, there's no reason why I'm sharing this and I shouldn't, but I'll say, you know, do you really want to know? And they go, I don't know. Do we? And I go, Lawrence, he's not a good guy. I mean, admire him as a football player. He's not a good guy. And, you know, but people want, they want to know that. Like I know more than you do. Anybody can see that that guy's great, but do you know that the da 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 da? That's the consumption we have now. You know, that's why Taco Tuesday for LeBron. We know about that. We know about you know what these guys are doing off the court, off the field, because there is an audience for that. We'll take a break. Uh, Phil Mickelson next hour, and Reggie Miller will join us as well. Back after this with our play of the day. Dan, coming in hot on a Monday with a huge IT Mother's Day report. I sent you guys a photo series our surveillance team had set up in uh, the toddler's household. Now, I'm going to run through some of these pictures before I ask the group a question. There is Todd uncomfortably setting the kitchen table. This looks doctored. Save it, Dan. <laughs> okay. There is Todd um, in front of the stove from one of the first times on record cooking something. Mm. Appears to be heating something. Mm. And the fire is on. Um then there's a picture of Todd proudly bringing in some grilled chicken. It appears that he hasn't cleaned the grill grates in a couple of years. That's why the black marks are there. And then uh, there's Todd serving dinner. It looks like a, some type of pasta dish. And then the aforementioned grilled chicken. And then maybe a calzone or wrapped bread of some type. Mm. Uh, Todd, before I... And then at the end, there's Todd or a superimposed version of him mm. uh, doing the dishes. Mm. Uh, <laughs> they, just say yay or nay. Believes that Todd nay. came up with made and served dinner to his family and cleaned the dishes with no assistance. Nay. Dan? Wow. Nay. I'm going to go, yay, I, I believe in Todd. Uh, Seton? Uh, I'm a nayer. Again, it's it's <laughs> came up with the menu, cooked it, served it, and cleaned up. McLovin? Hard nay. Hard nay. This is staged. Todd, how would you walk <laughs> us through what happened? Uh, I posed for the pictures. Jen, actually, my lovely wife, took the pictures. I said, the guys will never believe that I'm actually cooking you Mother's Day. Uh, it took this long for me to cook a meal. But that's a rice dish with a little rice aroni. Nothing fancy. It wasn't like a seven-course meal or anything. But, uh, yeah, there was chicken uh, chicken on the grill, rice, and I set the table. I did the dishes and Wait, everything. wait, just to clarify, because it was very confusing what you started yeah. with. Did you or did you not cook dinner for your family? I cooked dinner. Mm. I cooked the rice, I cooked the chicken, I set the table, I cleaned the dishes, everything you see there. The only thing I'm a little embarrassed about was if it was really doctored, I wouldn't be in a an old Bill Romanowski jersey and like ripped gray sweatpants. I didn't really dress for the occasion. I, I could have stepped that part of the game up. That uh, was kind of weak, that that was my Mother's Day attire, even though we're quarantined and we're inside. Anyone calling BS something. on the cooking part? It's a photo op. It's a... It's... I mean, it's nice. It's nice that you're trying to present that like you did it finally. <laughs> That's all your wife asked you for for years yeah. to cook a meal for years for Mother's Day. Did you, Todd, did you cook the meal because you wanted to do something nice for your wife on Mother's Day or because we guilted you on Friday's show? I would say 
85% would be the grief I'd get from you guys if I didn't do what uh, you were kind of instructing me to do. But I did want to do something nice for Jen, but it was definitely uh, relating to Monday show and how so I Dan, would be able to she should it. thank us. Oh, no, I'm good. She didn't have to. I'm <laughs> I think good. it all depends on how the food tasted. Yeah. She should thank she us. Might be Every, angry. Everyone seemed uh, pleased with it. The kids seemed pleased. Well, they were probably uh, confused to what was going on and who this man was in their kitchen cooking. I will say that calzone thing, that chicken palm roll thing, that was a purchased uh, purchased item. But the rice and the chicken and the you know the setting of the table and the dishwasher mm -hmm. and the washing the dishes, all that, that was legitimate stuff. But I am a little embarrassed about that. I forgot about the clothing part. That just looked very, very slovenly. Uh, 3.35 in the afternoon, you're setting the table once again. Oh, <laughs> yeah. wow. That is a bombshell. <laughs> that's a, that... that's a, that's just wow. a photo op. Is there anything you'd like that's to admit, just Todd? Staged. I, there's nothing to admit. I was excited about uh, doing something special for the wife, and she wasn't looking for jewels or diamonds or flowers or chocolates or anything. Yes, she was. You know, unless I was, maybe I was tricked. I know we discussed that Friday what they say they want is not necessarily, what, or that they don't want. That's a good catch, by the way, with the clock. It's setting the table at 3.30. There's nothing else to do. Mm. But you know what's weird, though? There's a another, there's a, a second clock. In oh, I know. Picture. I was going to bring that one up, Seton. And that's at almost 8 o'clock. Yeah. So somehow this turned into a f almost five-hour <laughs> event between setting the table and cooking those pizzas and chicken. It takes a while. Yeah, yeah. That, that, amateur. that was my next piece mm. of evidence, Counselor. I was going to bring that one up. It's like, wait a minute here. There's a Swiffer in the background. Yeah. Of one picture too, see that? Which, see that that's staged. Suspect. That's staged. <laughs> your wife's like, uh, put. Let's put the Swift Swiffer in there. Like you did that too. Dan, you want us to stay on this story? Yes. I want answers. <laughs> but what kind of psycho would make up rice aroni in the year 2020? Exactly. Only Todd. Yeah, psycho. but Todd lives in the 80s psycho. when rice aroni was big. Psycho. <laughs> Only serial killers use rice aroni in this day. You've seen my notebook? <laughs> rice aroni. I didn't think about the continuity of the, you guys are great with that, with the it's clock a, and everything. And rice aroni, chicken, and some kind of stromboli. <laughs> <laughs> chicken yeah. pommel. Yeah. Completely. Walk Definitely around in your guy fee area for bare me. feet. That's the other thing. Yeah, I didn't have <laughs> socks or shoes on. God. <laughs> The day. This is the play of the day. Check this out. Oh, so, oh, oh. he's hurt. He's hurt. He's real hurt. Oh, he's hurt bad. bad. They're gonna he's stop the fight. Oh. That's it. Oh, Justin Gaethje wow. stops Tony Bro. Ferguson in wow. round five. He's the that UFC's the Arrow most... fight champion. I never. Wow. I mean, that is the most amazing performance of Justin Gaethje's career. Spectacular. This weekend in Jacksonville, Florida, playing host to UFC 249 in front of an empty arena. It was originally scheduled April 18th, postponed due to the pandemic. It's courtesy of UFC on ESPN Plus. Play of the day. Play of the day brought to you by LegalZoom. No, ma no matter what happens, you want to make sure your loved ones are taken care of. That's why LegalZoom makes it easy to set up the right estate plan without leaving your home. Take care of your family today with the right estate plan at LegalZoom.com. It was a little bit surreal with uh, UFC because you were actually hearing everything. And you could hear the uh, commentary. You could hear the corners. It was, I mean, it was, you had to get used to it. And even then, when I sort of got used to it, it was still awkward to hear it. But I, but I liked it. It, be, you heard everything. You heard the punches. You you heard the grunts. Uh, Daniel Cormier, his commentary. Uh, fighters were actually listening to his commentary <laughs> during their bouts, and it helped them win. But the the new abnormal. No fans in the stands, but you're going to have NASCAR back. Golf's going to be back. Baseball will probably reveal its new plans. I, I'm still hearing around the 4th of July, 
I don't know what to expect around then, but that's what I keep hearing. It comes back to the 4th of July. That is sort of the circled date. Um, maybe in pencil, not in pen. But, you know, we'll update you on uh, what we find out and when we find those things out. We just showed a, a video or picture of uh, Todd cooking for Mother's Day. And we guilted him on Friday because this is all his wife ever wanted for Mother's Day would be Todd making a meal for her. And I'm looking at the pictures here. I don't know who documented this. It looked like it's Photoshop. It looked like it's staged. And Todd claims that he made a meal for his wife. And now there were a couple of things that stood out. You start to set the table at 3.40 in the afternoon, and then you brought in the chicken off the grill at around 7.40. That's a big timeline there, partner. Yeah, there were some continuity issues there. But I stand by the fact that uh, I cooked the meal. There was something in there that was like a chicken palm roll thing. I'm not going to take credit for that. That was a, a purchase. Do item, you little... swear, if I have a lie detector test, yes, that you did the entire meal, would you pass? I did the, I did the rice, the teriyaki glazed chicken, set the table, the dishes and everything. It was just the uh, couple of chicken palm rolls were the only thing I had nothing to do with. Okay. But I should have dressed a little bit more for the occasion. And, yeah, you uh, got on what, sweatpants, a, a Bill Romanowski jersey, and you're in your bare feet. Yes. I mean, that, that that doesn't really, like... Could have made a better effort. Yeah, you could be dressed up. <laughs> you could be dressed up. Maybe have a nice shirt. There's something. I didn't, not, I didn't have to have a tuxedo on, but I could have met somewhere in the middle with, like, a, I don't know, a polo shirt and a I, I, crisp, I, crisp jeans. Yeah, you, I'm not saying a tuxedo, but it would have been nice to have, <laughs> like, like, socks on. Or a pair of pants, maybe. yeah. Yeah, just I don't know. Just dress it up a little bit. That was uh, that was a poor effort as far as the attire. Yeah, yeah. But you did it. I did do it. Will you? I didn't burn. I didn't burn no third degree burns. We didn't have to call. When will you make another meal? That could be a while. No, I, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I would, if I had a guess, I don't know. Maybe in a month or so. Three hundred sixty-four days. Soon. Mother's Day. That's a good thing to shoot for. Mother's Day, two thousand twenty-one. And what was the response from your meal? The kids were very surprised and they gave me some ribbing that like, you know, how did that happen? And uh, much like you guys, they didn't believe it was actually a cook. So did they wonder kind of who the in. big man was in the kitchen by the stove? They were a food? little startled by that, but they saw the Bronco jersey and, <laughs> oh, the, uh, yeah. and the old sweatpants and the, and, the, and the baldness. And so they couldn't make out you know, the figure of, uh, of their dad being in there. But it was a little startling. There's that, a creepy man in our kitchen, mom. Bare feet. And what is uh, what is that? <laughs> You did look, there was a vagrant feel to you. <laughs> like a, if, if a sports fan was a vagrant, you were yeah. a sports fan vagrant. And truth be told, you know, I showered in the afternoon. I went for a nice walk. I had deodorant on and everything, but you would never guess that. If you had to guess the smell based on what I was wearing, you would probably be put off by that. Thank you, Todd. McLovin, <laughs> uh, what poll question were you going to go with here? I started with, did oh. the documentary make Michael Jordan more or less likable? Okay. 65% said more likable. Oh, okay. I mean, I am curious about a, a younger generation who's witnessing this for the first time, that you've heard the stories, now you're, you're seeing everything and you're hearing the stories. And I don't know if you go, wow, I, I really like that, or I see why people call him the GOAT, but because I've been around it my entire, from when Michael was at North Carolina to where he is now. I mean, I've been fortunate. I see you when you start your career and where you, you end your career. Uh, and with Michael, you know, when he, even when he went to the Wizards, I, I still was fascinated with what he did and even how he was doing it at that age because you had a lot of guys who were coming after him. Everybody wanted a piece of Mike because they wanted, they wanted some retribution there. It was also pointed out to me, that when you see how small Jordan can be sometimes, look at his Hall of Fame speech. Like, you're the greatest of all time. He's roasting people up there. Like, he would never, ever, ever let you have <laughs> final say. I mean, all of the, these are Hall of Famers, he's calling them out. Now, if somebody did that to Mike, I don't think he would take it anywhere near the way other uh, guys did that night. It was awkward. That's an uncomfortable moment. Yeah, see... But you see, you can't do it to Mike, though. No, you can't. Well, you can right. say things. You can say things, but it's just going to go right off because he knows he's better than you. Yeah, there's some things that could probably hurt him a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, Paulie.
if he were five and one, there'd be one guy who could say something <laughs> to him. And I don't know who that guy would be. It might have been Barkley. No. Yeah. But nobody got that one. Phil Mickelson will join us coming up and Reggie Miller. you know you were funny uh what time is it <laughs> you know like what age i don't want to use the tip i'm going to give you the typical answer is for a comedian is you doubt it all the time you know you you don't know i just know i liked comedy and i was i was drawn to comedy i was a fan of stand-up uh saturday when saturday night live came out i was 17 and everybody these guys in the neighborhood that i hung out with uh, we were so into it that we did that. We put on a talent show for our neighborhood uh, crowd. Um, it was called No Talent Incorporated. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was always a fan of comedy, and it wasn't until I got on the stage the first time in New York that I got the the bug of performing, of stand-up. And it never went away, and it still doesn't. I mean, stand-up is still... I lo Doing the acting and everything is is what I'm doing now. I, uh, it's what gets me up and running. But in my core, I feel that's what I do. I'm a stand-up. And acting is uh, one of the perks. Do you remember one of the jokes from your first stand-up? I remember a bunch of them, and I will never say them here. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, because you can't? One, I can't. Two, it's horrible. They're horrible. <laughs> I do remember, um, yeah, I, 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 even this one I want to say probably... I shouldn't, but again, this was go ahead, fire 25 away. years ago, and I was young and stupid, and it was making fun of the uh, written exam for your driver's license, the written how yeah. easy it is. This is the first time I'm on stage, uh, so you got to mark on a curve here. Um, but I said uh, they have to make the the permit test. They they have to make that harder. You know, it's like. Uh, a blind person is crossing the road. You should, A, uh, let him go by. Uh, B, stop and see if he wants to continue to cross. Or C, nudge him a little so he knows you're there. <laughs> All right. And, and that stayed in my act for about six months after that. Yeah. And then there are ones that are just, I can't even believe i did those those jokes on stage you know they're just so wrong yeah and unfunny too
Buckle up, boys. Time to go to work. Welcome, Welcome to the Dan Patrick Show. Give me a chance here. Go in, soak it up. Bringing Sal Palantonio, ESPN's national correspondent. Bringing you the biggest guests and best interviews. I said, give me two teams that are going to surprise being better, two teams that will surprise by being worse than what we think. All right, let's go with the Pittsburgh Steelers. They have Minka Fitzpatrick, Defensive Player of the Year candidate, without a doubt. They're going to make the playoffs in Pittsburgh. I think the Jets are a team that could put it all together very quickly under Sam Darnold. I think worse than we think. I'm going to go with Arizona Cardinals will get worse. I think the Houston Texans. I think the Houston Texans will take a step back. Broadcasting from the Mercedes Man Cave, this is Dan Patrick. Hope you had a great weekend, safe weekend. Dan and the Dan Ants, Dan Patrick Show. Glad to have you on board. This is hour two of our program. Phil Mickelson will stop by in about 15 minutes or so. Reggie Miller, next hour, we'll talk about the last dance. Reggie's moment is coming up, episode nine. But we'll talk to Reg about this side of Jordan that we saw, at least... You got a little bit of a sneak peek behind the curtain, the emotional curtain with Michael Jordan. You know, he was tough. Winning has its price. Uh, This is the way he led on the Chicago Bulls. You know, you just, that's who he was. And he couldn't change, didn't change, and doesn't apologize for not changing. That's just who he is. And, and, you know, when you want to win an argument and you say scoreboard, that's all you need if you're Michael Jordan. Hey, you didn't like the way I was a team, you know, what kind of teammate I was? Scoreboard. You didn't like what kind of opponent? Scoreboard. I mean, that's what this comes down to. But I do like that it's creating conversation about what we want out of our athletes. I was going to say heroes, but in this day and age, this time, what we're going through, they're not our heroes. There are other people who are true heroes. But you un- you understand what I'm saying. You know, how do you lead? Well, you got to be tough on your teammates. You got to be tough on your opponents. That's the way you lead. Well, you don't, and maybe we need more of that now. This winning is so important because there are times when you'll watch a game, you'll watch a player, and you don't know how important winning is because money is so big now. But is winning, does winning make a difference in your life? Michael became who he became as a brand because he won. Because if Michael ends up with 25,000 points and no championships, he's not Air Jordan. Air Jordan, that's a brand that means excellence. That means winning. That means championships. It doesn't mean, wow, look at those crazy highlights. Jordan became a brand because he won. Muhammad Ali became a brand because he won. There are guys who would could score. There were guys who were good boxers. I mean, you become a brand when you win. You know, Larry Bird won championships. He won three. Magic Johnson became a brand. He became a business. Like when you think of success, you think winning. And Magic won on the court and off the court. You know, that that's important when you're establishing this. And I don't know how important winning is to today's athlete. I know what it was like before. But I I have my questions about today's athlete. How important is it? If I'm making $40 million a year, how important is winning? How important is that offseason? Like Jordan was obsessed with getting bigger and stronger because he was going to dole out his own punishment. Obsessed with it. You got guys who take the summer off, don't do anything. There are other guys who they're obsessed with this. This is all they think of. And Jordan was that guy. But he could never turn it off. Whether it's cards, whether it's golf, certainly basketball. That's what you see with Jordan. And there were some moments last night, you know, Scottie Pippen saying if he had to do it all over again, he wouldn't have gone back into the game. This is, you know, after Jordan had left and Scottie thought he had. And I understand what Scottie's saying. Hey, I've earned this. I waited. You know, I learned from Michael. This is my moment. He's not here. And you're going to let Tony Kukoc take the shot? And then for Scotty to say, well, this is what Scotty had to say about that moment. 
I felt like it was an insult uh, coming from Phil. I was the most dangerous guy on our team. So why are you asking me to take the ball out? This is a season where he's taken the, the role of Michael. He's had this MVP caliber season. He thought it should be him taking the shot. And so Jim Clemens came over and said, Scotty's not going in. And Phil said, what do you mean he's not going in? And I go down and I said, are you in or out? And he said, I'm out. Wow. That's Dennis Rodman. <laughs> Steve Kerr, Dennis Rodman in there with Scotty Pippen. I understand it's a slap in the face. You have earned that moment. By the way, Kukoc hit the shot. But, and that helped save Scotty. I think. I actually now, thought it made it worse. What, if, if Kukoc misses and then Scotty can say, I told you, you well, shouldn't have had. Well, yeah, maybe. Kukoc hit the shot. Everyone's running to hug Kukoc and Pippen is way off in the background, yeah. sauntering onto the court. Yeah. Yeah. You might be right. Might have, you know, might have gone the other way, but you give Scotty the chance to say, look, I earned the right. You know, I understand what Phil did and Tony hit the shot, but in the moment I wanted people to understand I was going to, I had to live up to Michael Jordan. This is what Michael does. This was my moment. I'm taking this team. We won 57 regular season games. We're going back to the NBA Finals. This is my moment. And he never got that moment. And then they ended up losing in the Eastern Conference uh, Finals Game 7. But I get it. But Scotty, you know, fast forward to today, you got to have some perspective on that to say, you know what? Phil's a Hall of Fame coach. I should have trusted him. He was doing what was right for the team. Scotty thought he was embarrassed because – we're not going to design a play for you. Hey, thank you for all the things you do for this team, but in a big moment, we're not going to you. And, and so I, I understand what Scotty was probably processing, but to talk about it now, that's where I thought he would go. Yeah, I should have been in there. And it's a team sport. Uh, Michael didn't get every shot. John Paxson hit a big shot. Steve Kerr hit a big shot. Was it called for him? Yeah, sure. It wasn't called well, for Paxson. The Steve Kerr play was. How so? Like Michael's in the huddle, and he says, "You're going to be open." And he knew that he was going to be doubled, and and so Jordan called Steve Kerr's shot, and I he said, "Look, you're going to be open, and I'll, and I'll I'll hit you." Paraphrasing here. All right, welcome to the program. We'll get to phone calls here. Best and worst of the weekend. What you saw that you liked, you didn't like. UFC did what it promised on Saturday night, delivering a live sporting event. After almost two months of nothing, MMA fans got a chance to see a card that delivered in a big way. It's not a return to normal. This I, I keep saying it's a return to you know abnormal because this is a one night event, and and you're you have two individuals in the cage. This isn't the team sport because if it's only two people, okay, scale it down. If you can get testing, great. But if if you've got you know, 24 basketball players who at some point will be on the court. I got three referees in there. I got assistant coaches. Okay, you're just doing the math there. And all it takes is one positive test. That's it. UFC and WWE, that's different. It, it, if this is the NBA or baseball, football, you know, it's different. You know, they're, they're subjected to different governing bodies than the WWE and UFC. I was glad to see it, um, and it was something different. But I don't know, as we move forward, is baseball going to be able to do this in July? Feels like that's a target date. The NBA, getting players back in camp. Uh, football, football's got a little bit of time here. But I... I, I just caution people when they look at something like this and say, hey, everything's good. Man, I want everything to be good. But I just know where we are on the East Coast, things aren't good. And when we go, hey, the numbers dropped, only 600 people died. Okay, that's still 600 people died. Other parts of the country, I have friends who play golf every day. They're like, we don't get it. We can't relate. I understand that. I just know where we are is the epicenter, and hopefully it, it, you know, the curve 
is going to be in our favor. It dies down. We get this opportunity. We're going to have NASCAR back. We'll have golf back. We'll have UFC, WWE. I don't know when we have team sports back. I hope. Hope soon. But that's it. It's hope. Because right now, I, I wouldn't go to a game. And somebody asked me if your son played college football. I said, knowing what I know now, it, you know, today, no. I wouldn't want him to be playing. It, it's just the unknown. We can't will our way back. We can't force our way back. Once we have that information, great. But until then, it's just hope. But I did like that it was a live sporting event. It sounded different, but I liked it. I, this is what I'm curious about. When we get through this, what are we taking from how we've covered sporting events that we take into the next time this sporting event? The draft, the virtual draft. We're going to take some things into the draft next year. You're going to have these home setups. They're going to be encouraged next year. People are going to have fun with this, not just Mike Vrabel, Cliff Kingsbury. Like you'll, Even Belichick had some fun with this, but I think they'll be encouraged to do that. And, and, but I, as we have the sound, wait till basketball comes back and there's nobody in there. Wait, wait till you hear what... You, you don't realize this until you're on the floor when you hear things. And that, I think, will be interesting for people to hear everything that's being said. I mean everything. And football is the same way. And you would think, as paranoid as these coaches are, about lip readers. Can you imagine when you're out there and you're yelling? You, you, you can have your play sheet over your mouth like this, but you're going to hear everything. It'll be good. And if Aaron Rodgers had a problem with us picking up his uh, audible call, uh, he's really going to have a problem now. All right, 877 3DP show. Email address dp at danpatrick.com. As I mentioned, Phil Mickelson will join us coming up. And uh, Reggie Miller will stop by as well. His thoughts off the last dance with. Uh, they got to do. Okay, next week is the final two episodes. You have to. Ha well, you don't have to. I just have to have. One more dance. Like, just call it one more dance, and it's one more episode. And what I want is I get, I would have Isaiah Thomas back. I'd have Scottie Pippen back. I don't know who else you can have. You know, we can't have Jerry Krause because he's deceased. But if, if I would have the NBA entertainment people, I would have Andy Thompson, Michael Thompson's brother, who's really largely responsible for shooting this video, and he had a relationship with Michael, and Michael trusted him, I would want to know, you were shooting something you didn't know would ever make air. Like hundreds of hours of tape that you never knew if it was even be going to be shown. And those guys kept their secrets. They saw it all. They, they saw more than what you're seeing. They saw a lot more. But they kept, they kept it to themselves. I think that's fascinating. I'd love to know what they think now that it's finally aired. I think that they, they're owed that. That would be great. And if you want to have the director on, Jason Hare. And by the way, somebody if you write an article on the director, Jason Hare, somebody's got to call it Hare Jordan. <laughs> like, right? I think you, you got to do that for him. Maybe that's too easy there. Oh. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Had a, hopefully Mother's Day was kind to everybody. Fritzy cooked a meal for his family. McLevin, how about you? Everything good? Oh, great, great yeah. Mother's Day. But if we're going to talk Hair Jordan, by the way, there was a side story that got a lot of attention last night. A goat hair situation. Oh. You were in the crosshairs last night of social media. No pun intended. Yes. I actually didn't intend that. But yeah, a lot of people were... You had a lot of FaceTime last night. A lot. Uh... How did social media treat my hair? Great. Oh, good. Reverently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all I care about. To be fair, Dan, you know that window between 96 to 99 was, yeah, was good. good. Yeah, that was, no yeah. offense, it's like Kevin Costner, that was your peak time for your hair. Yeah. It really well, hit its stride. Yes, he. I, I believe the quote from my wife was, oh, look at Dan bringing heat with that hair. Whoa! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's not the only woman to say Whoa. it last night. I always said your, your <laughs> wife is smart. Yes, Todd.
It did bother me though at the end, you were doing a nice one-on-one -on -one sit down with Jordan and just as they're about to pan to you, they cut that clip. He was sitting with Jordan after the finals, after the win, you got the interview and it was great. And it was all Jordan and then they're slowly yeah, panning. Yeah, and then yeah. Just like in a half a second, one, one more second, they, they, you would be right there next. I, and I get these random t uh, text messages from friends and then I don't know what they're referring to. And, and then, you know, somebody put, Somebody sent a uh, emoji and then put eye candy on it. And I was like, what? And I put question mark. And they go, the Jordan documentary. And I went, oh, all right. The older I get, the better I was. Absolutely. Yes, McLovin. There was a big 93 versus 96 to 98 today, too. <laughs> with with <laughs> my <Twitter>. hair? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, 93 was early. Like, it was like... Yeah, I don't know. It was it was more athletic, maybe, but then you were more cerebral in the '96 and '98. Yeah, I I think I had a little more volume back in '93. Remember, my hair was puffy, and I needed that cost me a job. Like who who has lost a job because their hair was too puffy? At least that's that's what when Fox didn't hire me to do their uh, pregame NFL pregame show when David Hill said your hair it's puffy. And so I maintain that I didn't get that job because my hair was too puffy. Yes, Paul. In the 90s, were you like Jordan and you bullied other sports center anchors yes. with your hair? Like Bob Stevens, you didn't even talk no, to him. No, but I was that's that's I was being a leader. Right. Be that, my, make your hair like mine. Yeah. I would berate the other sports center anchors because that's what Mike did and that's the way I do it. And that's hey, winning has its price, Paul. Hair wise, well, Steve Levy was probably your Steve pimping. Levy was right there. Now, that's some good competition <laughs> with Leaves. Still do leaves oh we got to talk about the uh, monday night they're making a change there in the booth we'll talk about that coming up uh let me uh take a break phil mickelson's going to join us coming up next here your phone calls best and worst of the weekend and reggie miller in an hour from now 17 after the hour here on the dan patrick show simply safe home security longtime friends of the dan patrick show simply safe has made it easy to get comprehensive protection for your home there's no technician, no salesperson. You don't have to let anybody in the house. And when you get Simply Safe, nobody's getting in the house. You don't need monthly fees. There's no contracts to sign. Everything is there for you. You order online, you set it up in an hour or so or less, and your home is protected 24 7. It's going to be about 50 cents a day. That's it. They haven't raised their, I don't think they've raised their rates since we've known them. I think it's been $14.99 a month. Right now, when you uh, head to simplysafedan.com, my listeners will get free shipping, 60-day risk-free trial. So it's simplysafedan.com. Make sure they know that our show sent you. Simply Safe. Wishing you safety, good health. Go to simplysafedan.com and tell them we sent you. Hey, Phil. How's it going? Did you guys ever have any friction when you played against each other? I didn't have friction with him. I had friction with Vlade, because Vlade was the instigator. He, he was always talking and flopping. Me talking about flopping. Yeah. <laughs> but flopping. So I, it was Vlade that I had problems with. I never had problems with C-Webb, especially those great Sacramento teams. But yeah, I, I, was, I was a big fan of Reggie, but I didn't like him, because he was always beating our teams. You know, like he was the catalyst, you know, I knew he was the one that's gonna be talking junk, getting in the guys, and so he was a guy like you always wanted to play with, but when you're playing against him, you just hate him. He's talking junk, you saw what he did to the Knicks, you see him kicking out, this is the human kickstand, I've named him, because <laughs> when he shoots the three, all that, that leg stuff that he complains about when we do games, yeah, yeah he, he might have helped because invent all that. We were just talking about Dirk Nowitzki. Should that be legal, that he lifts that knee up? And 
I mean, it, so he creates separation. He's seven feet. I mean, it's, he's unstoppable when he and hits. And Durant has yeah. it now. Yeah. 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 But he can't do the knee. If, if I'm up on ridge like this, you can't just knee me. So you already have to have that space. So Dirk, one of the greatest scorers ever, he does that after he has the space. So it's not as unfair. He's maybe. not creating the space. He's just keeping the space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's not giving you the knee and pushing off. You but know. but Reg used it as a weapon. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, he would I, I trip used to you. love yeah. tripping and leg whipping people. I used to love <laughs> Leg whipping. Oh, God. I, it was like a joy to me. I think you going to run out here? It was the best. But then you would draw the foul, yeah, too. Yeah, look at you dummy. You <laughs> big dummy. And then he'd, he'd go there. How many times did you bounce the ball? Seven or Seven. Six. six. And you can bounce the ball and hit it, get real low and hit the free throw. It, it, it really get pissed us off. Yeah. Go All back. this pageantry <laughs> while he's doing it. <laughs> Let alone he comes out doing a Michael Jackson, you know, every game. <laughs> but Vlade probably created a lot of situations oh. that his teammates had to clean up for, right? Now, let's just think about it. The floppy <laughs> came in through the European player. A thousand percent. Why? You see soccer? Yeah. <laughs> you see this stuff in soccer. This is the worst flopping in the world. Yeah. With Vlade, Sharoon, it's all these guys brought over because during practice, they're actually playing soccer. So they brought that culture over. And Reggie did it where, you know, maybe you bump him once or twice in the third when there's a fake flop. sell it. These guys would just come over Paul, to you. Oh, you got to sell it, right? You got to yeah. sell it. And I would always say to Vlade, man, we got to chill with the flopping, man. We're not going to get respect. <laughs> with Shaq coming in now, they don't know if it's a charge or Vladi would have played for Duke. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs>
don't have it for a while, I miss it. And I remember how much I love it. And I appreciate it more for sure. What we're seeing with uh, the Michael Jordan Chicago Bulls last dance, you know, a lot of this is Michael and, and just how competitive he is. Like all, it feels like all great athletes have that gene. Like there's something there. Can you relate at all to Michael with that desire to be great at all costs? So I think that anybody that is uh, successful at, at a high level, there there's this selfishness uh, to them that you you uh, kind of block everything else out, and the only thing that matters is uh, being the best and and winning that championship. So I can relate somewhat because uh, it's very easy to get in that trap and and kind of lose the big picture, if you will, in life and get so uh, determined on just this this one aspect. And it's a a very, uh, I want to say it's a selfish thing, but it's also the, the trait that you have to have to be successful. Have you watched the Jordan documentary? I have, yeah. I think it's terrific. You played golf with him? I played golf with him a long time ago, and uh, I'm actually in the process of joining his club there in Florida, uh, the Grove that he yeah. built, which is really a cool place. He, he, he did an exceptional job there. How do you... How do you apply? Like, how does that work where you, you call Michael and say, I'm thinking about being a member or you get invited? You have, you have to be invited. And so fortunately I know a number of uh, members there and I'm going to be, uh, my wife and I just bought a lot fairly close there. It's only about 10, 15 minutes away. And so it would be a great place to, to play and practice. How good was Jordan back when you played? He, he's been around a four, I think. I don't know if he's still a four handicap. So I haven't played with him in a while but I've seen him play and it, it, he seems to get better and better. And the, the area that he gets better on are, are the shots around the greens, all the subtleties, the nuances, putting all the intricacies, the, the swing is uh, I, I'm not really, I haven't seen him hit it enough to see how much better he is, but the touch around the greens, he continues to get better at. Who came up with the idea to have uh, you with Tiger and Peyton and Tom Brady? Um, that's a, Good question. I don't know uh, where it really came from. There's a the gentleman, Brian Zerf, who does the Ray Donovan show on Showtime. He's kind of our executive producer. He and I have become friends, and we've been talking about the uh, the match for, for quite a long time. In fact, he and I were the ones that kind of came up with the idea years ago and brought it to CAA and had it developed before we even brought it to Tiger. And he's, very, he's got a very creative mind and thought that the interaction between uh, two other players and as a partner was going to be an important part of improving our match because when Tiger and I came down the stretch in Vegas, we clammed up. We didn't talk. We didn't communicate. <laughs> we, we, we tightened up, and we needed a partner there to, to get something out of us. And so because we won't have caddies, uh, Brady and I will be talking about each shot, club selection, win, break, and so forth. It's almost like I'll be his caddy, he'll be mine, and we'll be feeding off of each other. And so you'll hear a lot more interaction. Plus – the fact that Brady and Manning especially is such a good smack talker, it will be entertaining because of that. You know, he is so funny in the way he delivers his lines. Manning is that you, he elicits a response of laughter rather than a defensive response, which a lot of times when you're, when you're cutting somebody up, it, you, it can come in a little, a little hot and you can get defensive <laughs> and Manning does such a good job of making it funny. Is he the best smack talker out of all four? I think so because it's so subtle and understated and he just has a delivery that's soft, but the jabs sting. Well, he's got that aw shucks and he sort of talks out of the side of his mouth. He's got that Southern draw just a little bit, just let it slip, you know, slip out a little bit. That, that, that's exactly okay. it. So he, he will get the best out of Tiger. And I think that he'll be the kind of the, the one to deliver the smack talk and Tiger will be the one to deliver the great shots, which is fine. And then uh, Brady and I, you know, Tom and I, we usually have some pretty good responses too. So I think it's going to be a much more entertaining match than the first one, because there'll be a lot better uh, interaction. And you've played with Brady, Peyton's played with Tiger and you played with Tom. Is that how the, the team's formed? I think so. I've played a number of rounds with uh, Tom now. And uh, in fact, I had one of the greatest moments Dan, of my, one of those interesting moments that occurred when I did play with Tom, it was about a week or two before he was going to start throwing with um, uh, Edelman getting ready for training camp. And we were at Augusta National and he asked if I would go catch some passes. I said, yeah, I mean, I'd love to, <laughs> love to catch passes. 
Tom Brady. <laughs> we're we're 20 yards away. It's 7:15 in the morning and it's half dark out. And he's throwing these balls so hard that I'm worried about <laughs> busting a finger. I only catch the half, the second half of the pass. And so if the ball wasn't on my torso, I couldn't catch it. It would, if it was off to the side, I would, I would end up missing it. And I was so cautious about bending my fingers in a way, you know, having them so that I don't jam a finger. If there were three times that a ball hit the palm that it got through my fingers and hit the palm of my hand. And all three times I had a nerve shot go right up my arm. And I thought that's gotta be so hard to be running full speed with a helmet on bobbing up and down and have these balls coming in with such heat and grab them. It, ha- it gave me a new respect uh, for how good those guys are. But that was one of those unique moments that I kind of look back on and laugh and cherish because who gets to catch passes with Tom Brady at Augusta National at 7.15 in the morning? But imagine if he breaks your finger. And, and somebody says, oh, how'd you break your finger? Uh, Tom Brady threw a pass at me. Yeah, so that would that would uh, that wouldn't be good. Could be looked at either way, but it was two weeks before the Masters, so I didn't want to miss <laughs> the Masters because of that. Single toughest golf course in the world is where? That's the that's a that's a hard question to answer, but I would actually say Torrey Pines in San Diego is one of the hardest for me because when it's at sea level at seventy six hundred yards. The ball doesn't go very far. So from the tips, it's an, it's the longest course I've ever played. And when you throw in uh, some U.S. Open rough and firm greens like we, we get, I think that's the hardest course I've seen. But uh, a lot of people would argue Oakmont in Pennsylvania, and it would be hard to disagree with that. Oh, I played Oakmont. It makes you want to cry. Like you think you're hitting a good shot. Yeah. I mean, like you guys play it when the greens are really fat, when the conditions are really difficult. And I played and I went, I, it was a slugfest. Like, I was drained when I got through. I didn't enjoy it at all. It's beautiful. I just didn't enjoy it. So I would agree with that, is that hard doesn't always mean better or fun. <laughs> I think Oakmont, maybe Torrey Pines, is the hardest course. It doesn't mean I enjoy playing it. In fact, I only like to play it once a year because it's not fun, and it beats you up every single shot. But uh, I guess it's nice to have the ability to be tested like that, but I always enjoy having a – uh, course that you can reach some par fours or you you know and and par fives you can get to and and make some birdies and short par threes things like that those are always the fun hole the match champions for charity would be played may 24 tnt and tbs the medalist golf club in florida uh, tiger's home course peyton manning phil mickelson tom brady when do you think your relationship changed with tiger so i've always appreciated and respected what he has done for the game of golf and what he's done for me, because when he increased the ratings, uh, nobody benefited more than I did on the course and off the course. And, and Dan, there was a moment in, in 1991, when I won my first PGA tour event, the entire purse was a million dollars and the first place check was 180,000. And as I was starting my career, I, I thought and wondered if there would ever be a point where we would have a first place check of a million dollars because all these other athletes were signing for these big contracts. And, and I did not think it would happen in my career. And Tiger comes along, gets golf on the front page. And next thing you know, sponsors want in and we're playing for a million plus first place check every single week now. And it, it, it uh, and it's been like that for quite some time. And I've always attributed that to him and as well as, the increased opportunities off the golf course that he has provided. So I've always had this uh, respect for what he's done for me and my family because nobody's benefited more. But I think our relationship turned around 2016 when we were working together for the Ryder Cup. Mm -hmm. He was an assistant captain, and we ended up spending a lot of time on the phone getting ready, talking about players, picks, strategies, uh, alternate shot, and, and course setup and all these things. And getting an idea to see how uh, prepared he was and meticulous with each little thing, I, I had a new respect for him. But when we worked together for a common goal, which was to win the Ryder Cup, it it uh, brought us closer. I think that was kind of the turning point. You got a sneaky team this year in the NFL? So my sneaky team is the same team. I, I'm just a, a, a Charger fan. Unfortunately, they're not the San Diego Chargers or Los Angeles, but I'm still a Charger fan. I always think they're going to be better than they are. They lose <laughs> more games by a single score than any team in the NFL, and they lead in injuries. 
So if they can get that fixed, I, they have so much talent. I think they could be really fun. I don't know much about uh, the quarterback that they drafted, Justin Herbert, other than he's a really, really smart guy and a lot of talent. And I, I think that's a, a formula for success. He's got a lot of weapons around him. And I really like the GM, Tom Telesco. I think he's just a brilliant guy. And he, he, he brings in a lot of talent that uh, adds to the team not just first string, but second string too. a lot of depth. And I, I just think they're a really good team, but they just don't play to their level of talent or ability. It just uh, surprises me. So uh, yet I'm here. I am uh, stuck pulling for them every year and, and wishing them well. If I said you could win another major, or the chargers could win the Super Bowl. So I'm a pretty selfish athlete. <laughs> <I've got to admit. laughs> How about just a regular tour stop or chargers win the Super Bowl? Uh, so if you had asked me, you know, years ago about that, I would say the Super Bowl. But because I'm 50 and I kind of <laughs> cherish each win from here on out, I would take a regular tour with. Uh, it's great to catch up with you. I know it's for the All In Challenge and making a $10 million donation to coronavirus relief efforts and uh, should be fun. Uh, it's great to talk to you again, Thank Phil. You. I hope family's well and uh, thanks for your time. Dan, thanks for having me back on your show. It's nice to be back on. That's uh, Phil Mickelson. The match is going to be... May 24th on TNT and TBS with uh, Phil and Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, and Tiger Woods. All right, we'll take a break. Uh, we'll give you our best and worst of the weekend. We'll uh, talk to Reggie Miller coming up next hour as well. Back after this in the Dan Patrick Show. First team all club when you played. First team. Oh, well, Rodman. He's probably CEO, right? Yeah. Okay. I would go with Rodman. Um, first team all club. Do you ever smell alcohol in Rodman? No. Okay. But you can just look in his eyes like he had one of them kind of <laughs> nights. And it was almost like, not only did he have one of those kind of nights, man, you kind of wish you were with him. Because you know, he was at some probably some nice strip clubs. He probably had all the girls around him. Dude partied hard, but he played harder on the court. Reg, so you he got it done. I don't think you could have hung with Rodman. No, I know I could. You wouldn't I want could. to hang with Rodman. <laughs> A little bit. No, I, I, no. Saw it, I saw it up close one night in Chicago. And I went, man, that, that no, can't, no, 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 no. Okay. He had right. a, he had the entire bar, a private bar that was full of kamikazes. Oh my God. I think I just threw up in my mouth. And every oh. time you went to get a beer, he made you do a kamikaze every single time. Cause he was controlling the bar tab and he's like, bro, <laughs> he kept, he'd always call me Sager. He'd go, hey, hey Sager. <laughs> <laughs> do, a, do a shot. So I do a kamikaze. I'm just getting a Budweiser there. And, and, and he had his arm around a guy and a girl with a pol Chicago police shirt on. And I, who knows what happened after that? I, I, I just know that Dennis did not get cheated that night. Um, uh, yeah, yeah you, right. don't, you don't hang. want that. I cannot. No, I don't want that. By My way, liver does not want that. Rodman's best game ever. Came against you guys. What were his numbers? March of 92. Rodman had th 34 rebounds. While a member of the Bulls or a member of the Pistons? It was March of 92. I'm going to guess. Uh, or was he with uh, he, the Spurs? He was, he was with the Spurs. And he, yeah, he had 34 rebounds when he was with Spurs. Oh, my God. Come on, uh, Dale and Antonio Davis. <laughs> Keep them off the glass. Yeah. Come on, Rick Smith. But he didn't guard you, did he? No. Well, yes, on switches. Oh, okay. But he didn't. He would never. You're the best. No, he would never. No, he's not that dumb. 
<laughs> He's dumb. He was good, but he wasn't that dumb. He's not going to start off. Now, he might switch on a switch or coming off a screen, he might show out. <laughs> But he's not, no, no, not off tip ball. No, he's not that dumb. And he knows better. He had six. He knows better. He, how many did Reggie have in that game? Oh, boy. Yeah, and did we win or lose? If he got 34 rebounds, they better have won. Rodman had 34 rebounds and 10 points. Reggie, oh, no. Oh, no. That bad? <laughs> yeah, no. Did Reg get double figures? Reg was three for six from the field, 0 for one from three, and only six points in 36 minutes. What the heck? In 92? In 1992? Rodman shut you down. Oh, no. He did. Maybe he did guard me that night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe I was ejected. Well, how many minutes did I play? You played, That'll tell 30, me a lot. You played 36 minutes. Yeah, then he guarded me. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> You know who outscored you? Greg Dryling. I'm telling you, I was in foul trouble then, maybe. 92. So who was my coach in 92? I'm going to go with uh, who was our coach in 1992? Wait, you're going to blame your coach? Yeah, that's what the modern-day players do now. They always blame the I like coach. It. I like it. Six <laughs> points, Reg. I look at that again. Six points. Are you sure about that, Paulie? In 1992? I hate to say it. Michael Williams. Some guy named Michael Williams had 28 for you guys. He carried us. Yeah, Fritzy. He carried us. Bob Hill, head coach Bob of the Indiana Hill. Pacers. Bob Hill was holding <laughs> me back. That's what it was. <laughs> uh, what was the game played? In the Alamo Dome or in Market Square? It was, in, it was at the, actually at the Pistons. It was a Pistons game. It, Pacers Pistons. Oh, it was a Pistons. Ooh. Oh, you know, I know what happened. I was getting hit repeatedly. Oh, bad boys. By Rodman. Yes, it was the bad, bad boys. boys. It, was jo- it was Joe Dumars. <laughs> he shut That's you. That's what it was. Well, there's okay. no shame. Now it makes sense. There's no I'm shame. Say, San Antonio, now it's no shame. Now <laughs> it's making sense. Okay. Because if it was the Spurs, I'm, I'm really disappointed that I only had six points versus the Spurs in 92. But now that you said bad boys, Okay, yeah, I was getting my bell rung. That's what happened. Best and worst of the weekend. I'll give you hours. Let's hear from Greg in Illinois. Greg, best and worst of the weekend. Hey, DP. Uh, best, worst, a question for you. Best, busting out the Super Nintendo, playing a little Tech Bowl. Worst has to be Pippen quitting on his team. And my question for you is from the last dance from last night. Uh, would you rather have your favorite player or stars retire for two years in the middle of a run or uh, do load management like we see today? Thanks, man. Oh, no, I can't do load management. Uh, thank you, Greg. And, and you can say that was a different type of load management for Michael. If, if he truly stopped playing basketball, retired so he could play baseball to honor his father, um, it was a different type of load management. I just, if you were around the Bulls back then, I, I just can't imagine that every night with Jordan. And every night in the playoffs, it felt like that, that, that it was the media focus and the number of people covering a sporting event. And Michael Jordan was at the center of it. I'd, I'd not seen anything like that. You know, you go to a Super Bowl, you cover a World Series. Uh, this was different. You know, they were there for one person. Now, you can say Phil Jackson or Rodman or even Pippen, but people were there because Michael Jordan moved the needle. And and look, I don't know Scottie Pippen. I worked with him when we uh, did the NBA show one year, and I liked him. I I just, uh, I think there are moments where, you know, Scottie was great. Scottie nearly took his team to the NBA Finals. I wonder what that would have done to Mike's, legacy if Scotty had won a title without Michael. Would, would we view that differently? Um, it'd be like if um, the Cavaliers went to the finals without LeBron. We'd kill LeBron, right? We would. If Kyrie took them to the NBA finals and Michael wasn't on the team, or uh, uh, LeBron wasn't on the team, we'd kill him. And I know I keep bringing it back to LeBron, but I, I, I think we... There are a lot of sycophants with Jordan that don't look at the big, the entire picture. That's all. And I'm saying we, we look at the entire picture with LeBron, but we don't do that with Michael. And just be fair to both. That's all. 
Michael's still the best player of all time. It's just we focus on minutia with LeBron. Oh, he doesn't want to take the last shot. Oh, he's, he's not like Michael. Oh, he doesn't have that killer mentality. I mean, the list is so long. And that's why I say, tell me the last time somebody said something negative about Jordan. It's fear. That's all. Yeah, see. You're talking about how uh, like we're people bang on LeBron for not wanting to take the last shot, but then we're also criticizing Scottie Pippen for wanting to take the shot so bad that he sat out when he wasn't going to do it. <laughs> now, would Scottie have gone? What if they went into overtime? You know, Scottie sat down, but did you know? Would Scottie have gone in if that game went into overtime? After Jordan returned to the Bulls in 1995, that was March of 1995, he played the rest of that season and the next three full seasons without missing a game. Michael understood what he meant to the game, but he also understood what that meant to his brand. You got to see a guy wearing clothes, wearing shoes that you wanted. He was a walking billboard. And with what he was doing when he was wearing those shoes, it's like Tom Brady is saying, hey, my TB12 really works. Watch me, I'm playing football. Jordan was saying, I'm Air Jordan. These shoes, watch me. I'll be on the highlights if you don't get to see me in person. Yeah, Paul. And I think it was episode, shouldn't be surprised that Jordan played every game because I think he loved the games. He didn't like the ancillary stuff. I think it was episode six where they show him in his hotel room. He's like, this is my day. I'm going to sit in this room and avoid everything. It's quiet. It's nice. Then they show him going to the lobby and it's a madhouse. And then he's trying to get out after the game and it's a madhouse. And he even says in, I think it was episode six, he goes, because I, I guess I get paid for all this other stuff, you know, because the game, he has no problem with. It's all the ins and outs and getting in and out of restaurants. But he made himself so big. That's, you know, you, if I said to him when he was starting out with the Bulls or just starting with Nike, and I said, hey, you're going to be a billionaire. You're going to pay a price. You're going to be a worldwide brand. But your privacy is gone. Are you willing to sign up for that? And I'm sure he would say, of course. And then you get into the throes of it and you go, oh, my God. I, you can suffocate inside. Uh, Scotty Pippen. Winning percentage, Michael Jordan, regular season without Scotty Pippen. He won 52% of the time. Regular season with Pippen, almost 75%. Jordan in the playoffs without Pippen. Won two of 11 games. Jordan in the playoffs with Pippen won 70% of his playoff games. You can't argue the value of Scottie Pippen. He knew his role. And that's, that's the hard part. It's when you have stars and all of a sudden you're going, am I better than him? Should I be better than him? And, and when you get that, you know, Shaq and Kobe went back and forth. You know, McHale realized he wasn't Larry Bird. Uh, Kareem realized that it was Magic's team. James Worthy realized it's Magic's. Like, when you get that, it's so hard to get that because everybody wants to be the star. And then you get your boys who say, hey, you know, come on, man, you should be taking the latch. Hey, you're just as good at, you know, that's where it gets dangerous. You know, Kyrie Irving thought he was a, uh, an alpha, and he's not. That was LeBron's team. Kyrie hit the big shot against Golden State, absolutely. But that was not he, not, he wasn't going to be that leader. It wasn't going to be his team. You know, the Celtics with, uh, is it Rondo's team? Was it KG? Was it Pierce? Ray Allen? When LeBron went to Miami, what happened? Dwayne Wade was smart enough to go, this is my team, my town. It's his team. It became LeBron's team. But to be able to find that where you understand... I, I dealt with this at ESPN. I realized Keith Oberman was better than me. He did it better than I did. I had to compliment him. Now, we would compete, but we com were competing for each other so we would laugh, make somebody laugh, or you'd be interested, or that. Like, we were trying to entertain each other. Individually, we weren't as good as we were together. But, you know, I, I thought it was incumbent upon me to make him better to compliment him because he was coming into sports center. I had already been established there as an anchor and it was the smart thing to do because Keith is an alpha and I had been an alpha before with Kenny Maine. I, I wasn't a, I didn't want to do that with Keith. Then we were going to compete. Stuart Scott and I competed. 
you never it didn't go well. I mean, you would never know it. We didn't have chemistry, but he wanted to be an alpha and and I was already that alpha. Um, and he wasn't going to defer. But, you know, Stewart's one of the most competitive people I ever met. But, uh, yeah, I, I understand that, where you sort of have to figure out what your role is. And if you don't, it can go bad, horribly bad. All right, best and worst of the weekend. Todd, I'll start with you. My best of the weekend, my wife's appreciative smile for preparing dinner and taking care of the Come dishes on. last night, even though you guys questioned oh, the way I was just blah. posing That's and sad. pretending to be cooking. That's sad. Why, what's sad? Wait, who did the dishes? I did the dishes. Oh, I thought you said she did the dishes. No, that uh, she appreciated me taking care of the dishes and preparing okay. dinner. Right. My worst of the weekend, Shaq, saying we should scrap the NBA season altogether, come back next year, says no one will really respect the champion. There'll be an asterisk. And uh, that kind of bummed me out that Shaq's ready to say, let's uh, just do next year. Yeah, I don't, I'm not ready to attach an asterisk by this. I mean, it, it's going to be challenging, but everybody, we're not giving anybody an advantage. Uh, so I, I it, it, it's going to be, you know, strike shortened season. When's the last time somebody brought up a strike shortened season when somebody won a title? It, it doesn't come up. I mean, is there an asterisk by the uh, Astros? Maybe, but I don't think there's an asterisk by if the Lakers win this year. Now, people who don't like LeBron are going to go, yeah, but. McLovin, best and worst of the weekend. Best is I watched an old NBA game, Allen Iverson versus Vince Carter in the 2000 playoffs. Do you remember that? It was Toronto and Philly. Did he have Carter? 50, had, did Iverson have like 50 in that game? 54. 54. Vince Carter set the NBA record for threes in a playoff game with nine. He had 50. Iverson could not be stopped. There was nothing to do. And my my worst was BJ Armstrong talking trash to the Ooh. Bulls when he got traded to the Hornets. That was a mistake. That didn't work out. That didn't work out. Seton O'Connor, best and worst. The uh, best moment from the last dance last night was, uh, I think it might have opened the episode, but Craig Sager is off camera <laughs> asking Jerry Krause a question. <laughs> He's talking about like, you know, with all the backstabbing that's going on. And Jerry Krause obviously takes exception to the, the question, doesn't really care for it. And he's like, all right, that's it. The, the press conference is over and he walks off. And there's just some other reporter who goes, way to go, Craig. <laughs> I thought it was so funny because Sager was not afraid to ask a question. Not afraid to ask a tough question. Never. Way to go, Craig. Yeah, and then you just hear it where. <laughs> that's so funny. Oh, man. it's such a great line. Yeah. yeah. Um, my worst of the yeah, weekend, though, was I'd, I had forgotten that when Michael Jordan was playing baseball, it was just leading into the 94, 95 strike, which then immediately made me think of Donnie Baseball. Like, oh, man. Yeah. That was the shot. That was the chance. Yeah. Damn it. Paul Esther, best and worst. Uh, multiple reports that the UK government has given the Premier League Soccer League to the green light to resume the season June 1st. As a Liverpool fan, mm. this is fantastic that they can maybe win it on the field. Mm. They're way ahead. And then uh, I wouldn't call this worst of the weekend. Just uh, I was watching a lot of UFC on Friday night. Their fight, Tony Ferguson, he took a beating, and afterwards he had his eye socket broken. And his eye looked like something out of a movie. I mean, it, it was jacked up. But what a tough dude. Uh, Tony Ferguson. Uh, Rodney in Wisconsin. Hey, Rod, what do you have for me today? ADP, thanks for the call. Sure. Five, nine, whatever. Um, just a comment about uh, what you were saying, um, with what's acceptable from sports athletes today as opposed to the things that Mike did. Um, coming from a baseball coach, a high school baseball coach of 15 years, um, I think not only is there truth to what you said, but also what's acceptable from our athletes now and our coaches now is completely different than what it was even 15 years ago or 25 years ago when, when MJ and those guys were going on that run. I mean, there were things that I could say and do to my freshman baseball team 15 years ago when I first started coaching high school baseball that I can't say now to my varsity players things that I can say and do just because things are accepted differently yeah, different. now than they were before. And I think that has a lot to do with people picking and choosing the what's okay for MJ to do and what's not okay for LeBron to do. I think that's a, a lot of societal things have popped up over the years. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rodney. I agree. Oh, in my day, I didn't like how my coaches <laughs> treated me in my day. <laughs> I wanted to be hugged. I wanted to be coddled. <laughs> I 
don't want to be yelled at. Stop yelling at me. Reggie Miller will join us coming up here. Final hour, Dan and the Dan at Stan Patrick Show. Todd is not afraid, and that's one of the great things about him in that job. It's you have to be willing to hear no. And Todd hears no an awful lot, whether it's from our potential guest or his wife. He hears no. <laughs> <laughs> It's <laughs> amazing. I got, I got no, uh, I got no comment from you, yesterday. You got uh, maybe a better chance getting the commissioner on than you do. I, it's a maybe different, something it's with a your wife. Same frequency. Same yeah. frequency. <laughs> yes. Yeah, not only is Todd um, not afraid, he's also not aware. <laughs> which is how irritating. <laughs> That's a great combo. That is true. <laughs> you, you, you don't have the. Yeah. You unafraid probably, and unaware. Yeah. The Todd Fritz story. <laughs> unafraid and unaware. I'd like to think we, we haven't lost a guest because I was too much of a pest. If they just, you know, if they give me an honest answer and, you know, they're not available and it's not nothing personal against you and they just can't, can't do it or won't do it, just let, give us the, the reasoning and we'll move on. I'm not going to every other day keep asking for someone that has continuously, you know, said they can't come on. Well... You have. I have, but I, but they, I I have a break in the action, so I'm not harassing them to the point where they're just. They I know. I, I love that you do it. I couldn't do it. I even cringe when I read your email where somebody says no to you that they they can't come on or don't want to come on, not available. Well, I like to play dumb a little bit, so no for the second <laughs> hour, but he, he can do something in the final hour. But maybe tomorrow though. To, no, next day. I I look. I commend you because you go into battle and uh, you know sometimes you come out and you're wounded. Yeah, Paulie. What if we cut a deal with some of these places, like the Cowboys PR people? If you provide Jerry Jones Tuesday of next week, Todd will never ask again. Again? Well, because we we're o for the last twelve years with Jerry Jones. If you get one more, then we could be over the last, whatever, five or six years of the show. We're fine with that. Or maybe if we pay him because he's got mm. the, he's got that uh, Tuesday gig on the fan in Dallas. We don't pay. I know. But maybe then we could get him once a week. Would be great. I'd love to have Jerry on. Yes, McLovin. How about Stevens seems actually a, a little better <laughs> yeah. than Jerry. No, oh, no, 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 no. I yeah. got to have Jerry. I mean, we've asked for his son, but no, I... And now it's to the point where it's kind of humorous, where you just go, you know what? Hey, Todd, why don't you reach out and see if Tiger wants to join us? He's got a new book out. Maybe he wants to join us there. Yeah, McLevin. One time at the DirecTV uh, Celebrity Beach Bowl, they asked Todd, hey, can you go ask J-Lo? Oh. She would come on. He blew through 14 bodyguards and, like, elbowed them out, went right up to J-Lo and asked. Well, it was on the rundown, so I assume this somehow, some way has to happen. It said, you know, this is, like, the point where the interview comes with Jennifer Lopez, and, like, this bodyguard pretty much shoved me out of the way, and I got around him and went right up to J-Lo and said so. Yeah, but it was agreed upon. That was the thing. So her people agreed to it. Todd goes over and says, hey, uh, you know, you're going to do the interview. Come on with me. And he was, you know, she was going to walk over with Todd. And then all that's of a sudden. That's not happening. not doing that interview. <laughs> but he was so fearless to go in these bodyguards. Like, the guest is the number one. He's like a secret service would take a bullet for the president. I pointed. He would take a bullet to get a guest. I pointed to the script for J-Lo. I had a split second. I pointed to her <laughs> name on the script saying, this is, see, this says you're supposed to do this. But she didn't do another. You guys got to get out of here. She didn't do another. She didn't do another interview. Oh. Uh, I, I do. I give you a lot of credit because you you're not afraid. <laughs> Mail time. Knuckle sandwich T shirts. And Guy Fieri autograph knife. How about that? That is that is a knife. So it's got Guy's autograph on there. And Dan, you to man, guy. And then I don't know if this is the protective covering for said knife. I don't want to cut myself here. What could go wrong? No. 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 Hmm. 
keep cool guy. Maybe. Now this is this is when. Oh, did you hear what happened to Dan Patrick? Yeah, he cut off his hand. But he did it with a Guy Fieri knife. Thank you, Guy. Some assumptions. Welcome to the Dan Patrick Show. Give me a chance here. Go in, soak it up. Bringing Sal Palantonio, ESPN's national correspondent. Bringing you the biggest guests and best interviews. I said, give me two teams that are going to surprise being better, two teams that will surprise by being worse than what we think. All right, let's go with the Pittsburgh Steelers. They have Mika Fitzpatrick, Defensive Player of the Year candidate, without a doubt. They're going to make the playoffs in Pittsburgh. I think the Jets are a team mm -hmm. that could put it all together very quickly under Sam Darnold. I think worse than we think. I'm going to go with Arizona Cardinals will get worse. I think the Houston Texans. I think the Houston Texans will take a step back. Broadcasting from the Mercedes Man Cave, this is Dan Patrick. Well, we made it to the final hour on this Monday. Dan and the Danettes, Dan Patrick Show. Glad to have you on board. Reggie Miller will stop by in about 20 minutes. Talk about the last dance. A couple of interesting moments there. You got to see those basketball games on the set of Space Jams when Michael had the Michael Jordan Dome built, and they had those pickup games, and those were real. That was serious stuff. Reggie, of course, took part in that as well. So Reggie will join us uh, coming up here in a little bit. Zion Williamson has become the focus of the, the latest college basketball scandal. He's accused by a former marketing agency of taking improper benefits and accused of taking money to go to Duke. Now, it's a serious case, or at least it sounds serious, but... Recent changes in college sports makes it a little hard to be too alarmed here because we're getting closer and closer to the accepting of these benefits or, you know, like Reggie Bush, USC wouldn't have been punished for Reggie Bush. And if you pay back the loan, you know, I, so I don't know where, what is fact, what is fiction with this, but people want these athletes to get paid, it feels like. Or you should be able to benefit off your likeness. There's only a couple of players who are going to be able to do this. My problem is, you know, how far does this go? How deep does this go? How much money is, you know, do they cap the amount of money you can make? I mean, there's so many questions I have with this. But if Johnny Manziel wanted to capitalize on his likeness, go ahead. Tim Tebow wanted to capitalize, go ahead. Zion Williamson, go ahead. Money is going to be there for certain players. It just is. The shoe companies are involved in this. That's why you can remove a coach from this. Now, you might have to have an assistant coach take a bullet here, but the head coach can go, I don't know anything about it. Like Rick Pitino could say, I don't know anything about paying a recruit $100,000. Now, his assistant coach might, but I'm assuming you probably have to get some clearance there. Hey, how did we get this guy? I don't know. Just showed up magically on campus. You know, we can have outrage here. And, and maybe, you know, Zion Williamson got improper benefits. Do I think he did? Yes. But do I care? No. I know that you're going to say, well, boy, that kind of uh, not exactly the puritanical approach we expected out of you. I, I just, I know what happens. And they, they have shoe companies that are aligned with certain schools. You're going to push them into those schools. I know what happens. Probably happens a lot more than we think. And if Zion was going to sign up as a Nike client, Duke and Nike, like, you just use common sense with this. If one of the assistant coaches at Kansas is on record as saying, hey, Zion's people want some money and they want jobs and housing. Okay, that's Kansas. And they're under suspicion with this. But, you know, I, I don't 
I don't know if people are going to get upset about this. I don't know if the average basketball fan is going to be upset about it. I don't know if it leads to Mike Krzyzewski or not. I have no idea. But do I think that the shoe companies steering kids towards schools? Yes, I do. Yeah, Paul. I, I do think, though, I read over the Zion story, and it's an accusation, and there's a long way to go before it gets uh, real and the NCAA involved. But I think a lot of people, sports fans out there, may think, I wonder if the school he went to would get the same coverage that Louisville went, got, that Memphis got, that Kansas gets, that mm-hmm. uh, Calipari gets when the, his name is thrown apart. I want, I'm just curious if big sports networks cover Duke the same way. Well, we don't. But there's a reason why we don't. The other schools that you're mentioning, there is a little bit of a track record here. Um, you know, had this been at Kentucky, this would have been a John Calipari story. Had this been at Kansas, it's a Bill Self story. Had it been at Louisville, it would been a Rick Bettino story. It's at Duke, it's a Duke-Zion Williamson story or a Zion Williamson story. So we frame it how we want to frame it here. But do I think that um, all of a sudden Zion ended up at Duke? And you may want something from this school or this school, but then you don't want something from that school. And maybe you don't, you're not even asking the school. Maybe you're asking the shoe company because this is the marketing company. And they say, look, Zion should just come clean and say that he got uh, improper benefits. Okay. Not going to be the first, not going to be the last. You know, because the NCAA, back in the heyday of UCLA, If you really wanted to look, you could have. Maybe you didn't want to look because it's John Wooden. But if you wanted to look, you probably could have found some things there. Maybe they didn't treat UCLA the way they would UNLV. Jerry Tarkanian, always under suspicion. John Wooden, never under suspicion. We sort of frame it. We frame it differently. Yes, Todd? It's one thing if a young athlete goes to the highest bidder. I'm not saying it's in Zion's case or not, but I think what may not sit well is all of a sudden the uncle gets the new tractor and the mom's now on the payroll that there's some job they created at the school. There's all this other periphery stuff. It might be better if you give the kid the money and then the kid decides what to do with the money for his family. Once family members are involved in getting these special prizes and, and jobs and stuff, it just makes it a little, lot more seedy. Yeah, but what stops, just the kid money. what stops Nike from going, we're going to hire Zion's mom? That's all. What 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 stops? What prevents that? You just gonna pay her? We're gonna pay her two hundred thousand dollars as a consultant. How does the NCAA stop that? And I don't know. I mean, I, I I'm I'm asking the question. I don't know the answer to. But if you know the latest story is Zion got improper benefits. Did he get it from the shoe company? Did he get it from Duke? Got it from Duke. Now we got it. Now we have some questions that need to be answered. But the shoe company, I. It happens. It's going to happen. We've allowed the shoe companies to be so important, an integral part running college basketball because of the amount of money. And this goes back to Sonny Vaccaro, the guy who signed Michael Jordan to the Nike deal. He realized these coaches weren't making that much money. I'm going to give you a lot of money, but I want you wearing our product. And it was brilliant marketing. Brilliant. And we forget all about that. But that's how it started. Sonny Vaccaro got the Big East and got all those coaches. And all of a sudden, everybody is wearing Nikes. And the importance, and then the Big East blew up. And now you had to have your Nikes there. Then you bring in Michael Jordan. And then the rest is history. Yes, Eaton. Why are college basketball coaches paid by shoe companies? Yeah, well, that's... That's been a question that's been asked, and I don't know if we ever, you know, does the chancellor, the president, you know, why does he allow that to happen? Right. You know, because should you, you get a salary, you know, now you're getting an endorsement, but the kid can't get an endorsement, but the coach can. Yeah, Paul. It is interesting, the guys who've been talking about it are the players that should most have been paid for their work. Johnny Manziel put A&M on the map more than they've been in 30 years. Reggie Bush did the same thing for USC. Zion Williamson carried the entire sport of college basketball. Yeah. 31 nationally televised games. If anyone, that's, I think, will there be no outrage because when you look at Zion Williamson, you're like, man, I'm, I'm kind of glad he got paid for his time in college basketball. He entertained us, and he took the risk and almost hurt his knee, and, and he was on 31 national TV games. Yeah, I'm really shocked anymore. Where I go, well, I didn't think that would happen. Like, there's certain things that if you said, 
Cal Ripken Jr. or Derek Jeter did steroids. Okay, I'd be surprised. But there, there aren't many moments where I go, wow, I didn't see that one. Well, I'm shocked at that. Because you, if you've been around long enough, the people either talked about it, they've done it, they've hidden it. It just, these things have happened. And the amount of money that's involved in this with college football and college basketball, what coaches make, and coaches are the stars in college basketball because players change, coaches stay the same. But they're the ones that make the money. They make the big money here. I also saw a long article. It uh, is written by the former GM, Mike Lombardi. He wrote for The Athletic. And he says Cam Newton is too good to be a backup, and that's his problem. Now, he talks about uh, that don't ever think NFL teams always make the common sense decisions or don't have personal agendas in place to prevent them from making smart decisions. Take the Chicago Bears, for example. They traded a fourth-round pick to Jacksonville for quarterback Nick Foles. They now inherit Foles, a contract that had $17 million in guaranteed money in 2020. They move the guarantee into future seasons, so in essence, Foles gets all the money owed to him Bears get some relief. With the cap relief, the Bears get a less threatening quarterback challenger to incumbent Mitchell Trubisky. Cam Newton would walk into the Chicago locker room and every player on the team would immediately feel, quote, he's the man. There would be no doubt. From day one, Newton would endear himself to his teammates, leaving Trubisky with zero chance to compete, which is not what the Bears want. They want to challenge Trubisky, but only in a kind, polite way. By the way, if Foles isn't the starter, the Bulls will have themselves a very expensive backup with guaranteed money because of the way the structure they structured his deal this year and next. So, The Bears could have easily taken Cam Newton instead of Nick Foles, yet they chose comfort and familiarity. They did not choose the better player. It's Mike Lombardi in the uh, Athletic. By the way, my Jags are officially tanking. They brought in Mike Glennon as the backup to Gardner Minshew. It's official. <laughs> it is official. We are tanking. Because I wondered, I thought, you know what, Jacksonville, you want to push the envelope a little bit? Bring in Cam Newton. They don't want to win this year. And, and if I'm a Jacksonville fan, I get it, and I would embrace it. Let's be bad. Let's be bad. Let's, yes, McLovin. Have we all had a moment where we thought, wow, Mike Lennon might be pretty good? I think even you had a moment where you're like, wow, Mike Lennon could kind of spin it a little bit. No? I think when he was on Tampa, I liked him a lot. Yeah, I mean, he can throw a ball. I, don't, you know. I can throw a ball. Stop with that. I did have a Mike Glennon moment. But then you realize he got he started over Russell Wilson, and that's why Russ transferred to Wisconsin. Um, yeah, Mike Glennon. He is your backup quarterback in Jacksonville. Yes, Paul? Mike Glennon, as a rookie with Tampa, he was uh... – 19 touchdowns, nine picks. Yeah. That's as good as it got. That's okay. Tampa would have taken that last year instead of the 30 for 30 on Jameis Winston. Will they do a 30 for 30 on Jameis Winston? Yes, McLevin. Do you remember that story where Mike Lennon was invited to the Bears draft party? He was going to be their starter, and the GM <laughs> invited him, and then they drafted Trubisky, and he was standing there. I'm standing right here. Oh, and you're using a real high draft. It's not like, you know, I mean, Jordan Love is uncomfortable for Aaron Rodgers. This is where you trade up. Hey, Mike, hey, come on in. Yeah, we got a draft party. Come on in. Boy, do we have a surprise for you. And the Chicago Bears select Mitchell Trubisky. I think I'm going to be going now. All right, a couple of phone calls, then we'll take a break. Reggie Miller will join us. Uh, Ryan in New York. Hi, Ryan. What do you have for me today? Hey, Dan, uh, first time, uh, long, well, many time, long time, six foot combo <laughs> guard. Uh, I have a best investor for okay. you. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, best of weekend, obviously, Mike, uh, getting a little emotional seeing that uh, was, was special for me. And prior to that, I think uh, ESPN played uh, UNC at Maryland. I always had heard stories about my dad telling me uh, about Lynn Bias. He Ooh. was a bad man. Ooh. Finally got a chance to see him play. Ooh. Um, and a question for you. I always wondered, how was he going to end up uh, on the Celtics, and how does that kind of change uh, the flight pattern, no pun intended, for Mike going through the East? 
uh, the Celtics already had Hall of Famers, and they were going to add uh, Lynn to that equation. Obviously, the tragic ending to that story, but can you talk a little bit about how that was going to happen and how you saw history uh, change? Almost? Oh, it would have been rewritten because you had Reggie Lewis who passed away. I would the the Celtics had the transition in place. It was perfect. They could have taken a little stress off Bird because of his back. Uh, Mikhail Parrish, DJ Ainge, you had Len Bias and Reggie Lewis as well. So they lost two, you know, what I think would have been Hall of Famers. And Len Bias was, that was a spectacular player. Like that, when you watched, it didn't take long before you went, which one's Bias? It was the guy who was blowing right Bias. See what I did with that, Todd? Yes, McLovin. I might have this wrong, but I'm reading it was a Gerald Henderson trade that landed yeah. in that first round pick. Yeah. What? Yeah, Gerald Henderson. <laughs> All right, let me take a break. Reggie Miller is going to uh, join us. More phone calls coming up. Take a break here on the Dan Patrick Show. You check things all the time, email, Instagram. How about something important like your credit? Discover makes it quick and easy. Best of all, it's free. Discover is now offering FICO credit scores, the score used by 90% of top lenders, and doing so for free. Even if you're not a customer, checking your score won't hurt your credit, and you can check each month for changes. The Discover credit scorecard, free for everyone. Learn more at discover, discover.com slash credit scorecard. The Discover Credit Scorecard, discover.com, credit scorecard, limitations apply. Shaquille O'Neal, the big podcast with Shaq. Podcast1.com is where you'll find it. Uh, we were looking at Anthony Davis when he put up 59 and 20, and then we saw the other games. Chris Weber had a similar game. You had one where I think he went for 61 23. Do you remember that game? Yeah, that was the birthday game. That was the uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar would not look at me game. So I had to try to earn his respect. <laughs> Explain that. He was the, uh, I, I, I guess he was assistant coach for the Clippers. Yeah. And every time I touched the ball, he put his head down. So I took it as a sign of disrespect. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, you're not going to look at me? So I just wanted to, you know, show him that, yes, I was in the building, and yes, I was great. Wow. True story, Dad. Did you ever talk to Kareem about that? Never. I've, uh, what, I played for the Lakers how many years? Eight, 12? A lot. Yeah, I, I probably I probably only talked to Kareem a total of three minutes. Out of all those years? Yes. Did you want to talk to him? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. But you, you know what? The guy that the guy that was Kareem and Wilt Chamberlain's voice for me was a guy by the name of Bill Berger. The uh, you know, cause, former coach? Yeah, former coach. Because, you know, a lot of times when when you're out there by yourself and, and you're trying to get to that next level, it doesn't take practice to get you to the next level. It takes conversation. It takes guidance sometimes. So, like, you know, I was putting up big numbers, big numbers, big numbers, and then Bill Perker would say, Shaq, you know, uh, once, uh, you know, Kareem had a similar situation where he go middle all the time and they take away the middle. He just drops that five or six times in the game and open back up. So, you know, Bill Berger had a million stories about what Kareem and Will went through. And that right there took me to the next level. And uh, Bill Berger, if you're listening, brother, thank you again. I also saw where uh, Jimmy Walker, PGA Tour player, was talking about. He he slammed the USGA about possibly reducing these, uh, you know, the distance these golf balls go. 
Uh, did you see that story with the USGA and the uh, RNA where there's studies looking at, you know, do we reduce how far you can hit it? I saw the, I saw the study, yeah. Did you, what did you think? Well, I think I don't want to lose these great golf courses. I, I still want them to play like they should play. I understand modern technology, but, but I do think it's gotten a little out of hand. I think it's a little crazy, the distance that guys are hitting the ball. Yeah, there's certainly that rule of thought. I don't know, uh, you know, I, I I don't know how to agree or disagree in the sense that I I agree with what you're saying. I also don't feel as though the guys who have been work getting in the gym, working out like the Dustin Johnsons and the McElroys and guys that have been getting after it, should be punished because they are increasing their distance. We've all known that the USG cut the overall distance and drivers and balls and so forth years ago. So you can really uh, mostly attribute it to uh, the athletes getting better. And I don't feel that's right to punish them either. So I'm kind of caught in the middle. But if I reduce the distance it can go, the guys who still hit it longer are still going to hit it longer than the other guys. You're, 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 you're still going to have that separation. You're just not going to be driving par fours. That's, that's the point that I wanted to make. If you reduce it to 10% and the guy that hits it um, 280 yards, he's going to lose 28 yards. The guy who hits it 330, he's going to lose 33 yards. So you're going to punish him uh, yeah. more. You're going to. Pun- but but so. you played courses where, and, and I don't know if the scores are reflective of that. But you know, back in when you were 27 and playing a course at 47, uh, you know that it, it's a different course now for some of these guys, and I don't know if. If that makes the game better or not, maybe that's what the bottom line is. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I don't really have a strong opinion because I kind of have feelings both ways on it. Backup quarterback. Probably mean-spirited on my part. He threw 19 touchdown passes in 2013. How many touchdown passes do you think Mike Glennon has thrown since that 2013 season? The answer is 17 total. Let's bring in the Hall of Famer, Reggie Miller. Boy, Reggie has a great Sunday. Every Sunday, Reggie gets to sit down and watch Michael Jordan <laughs> and the Chicago Bulls. This is the worst assignment you've had probably since you were in school at UCLA, Reg. Oh, my goodness. I would take UCLA right now as opposed <laughs> to this education I'm going through every Sunday. But I will say... Um, you know, watching, I think it was the end of episode seven last night, MJ, you don't need to apologize. You don't need to apologize of what your DNA is, because this is what I tell people. At the end of the day, the headline is not going to be Bill Whittington let us down, B.J. Armstrong let us down, Judd Buesler let us down, Steve Kerr, not even Scottie Pippen. The headline is going to be Michael Jordan. So you have to be a taskmaster. You have to whip guys into shape. Don't apologize for that. That's your DNA. That is how I was somewhat raised, because I was raised by Magic and Byron Scott and Michael Cooper. Win at all costs. Absolutely. And if you don't want to fall in line, you see the door? Bye-bye. I don't want to hear it. And... You know, when Steve, it's funny because when Steve Kerr uh, is kind of reminiscing on the fight, that's every Tuesday. That's every Wednesday <laughs> during the 90s, during practices. You always fought your teammates. I think it, in today's age of social media, it would have been blown up. But it, that, when I'm looking at that, I'm like, yeah, so? Okay. They got in a fight. You know how many times I got in a fight with Dale Davis, Antonio Davis? I mean, so? That happens. Did you ever throw it, a punch? It, of course. That's what fights are. What do you think fights are words? Yes. A lot of yeah. some pushing and shoving. I solve okay. problems with words, Reggie. Well, we didn't solve problems with words. <laughs> Afterwards. Afterwards, we would talk it out. Yeah. But sometimes you got to have a little tough love. So what? I, I, you know, when he was, you know, got emotional about it, you know, before this doc came out, he was talking about, you know, people are going to think, 
you know, they're going to see me in a different light and they're going to think I'm a bad person. Yeah, we all know that, MJ. <laughs> we all knew that. Uh, well, I, I'm like, so what? Uh, That's what made him great. I was surprised that he cared this much about being liked because I don't think Michael, when he played, cared about being liked. He wanted to be feared and he wanted to be respected. Maybe he's mellowing a little bit here. Where I don't think so. Uh, to me, if you're asking me personally, this is what I personally feel. I think that's an act. I think he can, he could care less what people think. Really. Wait, you I think, think he... that crying last night was an act? No, that was real. Oh, okay. That was real, but I, he, I don't think he cares what what people think. That's what made him MJ. That's what made him the black cat, black black Jesus. That's what made him. But when he goes to the Hall of Fame and he makes it a roast, these are all accomplished people. Like, Mike never turned it off. And, and you can imagine, hey, I'm going to make fun of Scotty Burrell and Judd Bushler and Bill Wennington. I'm making fun of Hall of Famers to their yeah, faces he there. <laughs> he, that's why I'm saying he, he, he can care less what people think about him because he can't turn it off. Yeah. Because it's his DNA. And that's what made him great when he says, because you've never won anything, that, that's what it is. It, it, it takes a level. You've got to go to different and dark places, and he has. And I don't think he should apologize for that because he is the GOAT. Yeah. He's the greatest player of my generation, of any generation. And he shouldn't have to apologize for how he is wired um, because – he brought a lot of joy to the city of Chicago and a lot of money in a lot of people's pockets, his teammates, the league. Um, so he shouldn't have to apologize for that. Are there things that I'm sure he wishes he could have said or done differently? I'm sure. But that's not his DNA. But why can't he give credit where credit is due? He gives a, the, the, If there's one thing I do – there's ways like him laughing at, at Gary Payton. That was wrong. And to me, that is wrong because there's ways he could have said, yeah, you know what? He made me work in those two games, but, you know, I, I came back and gave it to, to them. The re there's ways he, he could have framed it. But guess what, guys? That's why he has six. Six finals, six finals MVP, yeah. and the GOAT, right? That's why he threw shade at Clyde. He threw shade at Dan Marley. He's throwing shade at Isaiah. I'm next next week. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this is what made him. Wait, right? do you He's know? Never going to give credit to anyone. Do you know what's going to happen next week? Have you I been have told? I have no idea what is going to happen. If I but knew, I'm just would you want to know? the pattern of what I've been watching, <laughs> and he has killed everyone. Craig Elo, Dan Marley. He threw shade at Clyde. He had not been equal. He just laughed in Gary Payton's. Gary was Defensive Player of the Year, Hall of Famer. You're right. It doesn't matter. I, I think the only people he he probably hasn't thrown shade, maybe Magic, you and know, Larry. Larry. I think he, was, you know, those guys are what helped pave the way for him. But us little minions that <laughs> came after him, <laughs> no. Oh God, I I there's part of me that hopes he goes after you. Just, oh, he's going. But he's but going. but that's because you you know you got to it. Like he he only go he's going after you if you know there was really something that was going on. I mean, and that's why I want people to understand him laughing and people like wanting to like throw shade at Gary Payton. He's laughing because he knew Gary brought it and Gary wasn't backing down. Gary's one of those dudes you can walk through an alley with, right? Yeah. So he's laughing at that, but MJ knew. Come on, man. He knew. <laughs> so, again, I don't know, nor do I care. But as long as he, at the end of the day, he respected me, and maybe he doesn't respect me. I don't care. I really don't. But it was fun. Are you sure? I was, that he respected me or didn't respect no, me? No, that you don't care. I don't care. Really? It's, it's, I don't care for you. I don't care if MJ likes me or not. Well, really? no, respect is one thing. Like, well, whatever. So, if he does, if he doesn't, well, okay. is that going to change my life? No. Okay, it's not going to change my life. Do but you say anything negative about him? 
I can't remember. <laughs> oh, <come laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. I mean, it, it was a few months ago. Maybe I don't know. Paulie, would you t- would you text the director, I'm on it. Jason Hare, <laughs> and ask if Reggie said anything mean about Michael? Uh, well, hold on. Well, mean or him making up stuff? You never know. He could have. I could have said. Uh, Hey, you were a little late on that screen, and he could have been like, he's the worst defensive player of all time. He could have thought that. Right? So who knows in in his mind what he's thinking. I mean, the whole LeBradford, because I do remember that. Any little slight, you know, he was going to use. So, oh, well. Did you say anything after a game to – did you say, like, good game? Yes. Oh, you did? I was taught, yes, but I was very young when I was a rookie, you know, and – he let me know, you know, that's when the whole black Jesus thing came up. And he was like, don't ever speak to black Jesus like that. I said, wait, first of all, you're referring to, your, you're referring to yourself in the third party by calling yourself black Jesus? I said that to myself. I was like, oh, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So set the scene where Mike refers to himself in third person. I'm a rookie. <laughs> Exhibition game. We're playing in one of these crazy small towns because that's where exhibition games are to kind of spread the wealth and the love of basketball. And Mike's going through the motion, you know, it's an exhibition game. Who cares? I'm a rookie. I'm going 130 miles an hour because I'm trying to show my teammates and you're going against Michael Jordan and Chuck person's egging me on like that's, that's Michael Jordan. Really? Look what you're doing to him. You know, <laughs> first half. He's just, Michael's just going through it. Right. You know, I got 10 or 12 by half. He has like two or four. And I'm like, just talking to him like, you you, you can walk on water? That's what they say? This is it? This is Air Jordan? And he looks at me. He's like, okay. So the second half, he ends with 45. So I end with, I had 10. I ended with 12. So he outscored me 40 to (laughs) 2. And as we're walking off, he subtly says, hey, don't ever talk to black Jesus. Like <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him, I was like, and I looked at Chuck, and Chuck, like, shrugged his shoulder. And I was like, you're right, black Jesus. And I just kept walking off. And that's kind of what probably started our somewhat contentious relationship. Oh. But I should have known better, you know, but I couldn't hold, I can't hold my tongue. That's my problem. But do you think that he respected the fact that you went at him? We'll find out next week, won't we? Oh, God. I can't wait. I just hope that Mike unloads on you. He will. I do. But that was my thinking. Like, when people are saying, yeah, we we all know how that turned out, you trying to retire Michael Jordan. (laughs) Is that wrong for me? Wait a minute. That should be my thinking. Yes. I would. I I can't speak for the rest of my teammates, but that was my thinking. Like, this is my... This is my chance. I've got a team. I got my guys. You have your guys. You're the champs. You're Michael Jordan. I do want to retire you. God. It didn't happen, but that should be my thinking. You guys should have won. You, you, you guys. Stop it. You're gonna make it hurt. That it was does a, hurt. You guys had a great team. You had a better all-around team than the Bulls did. It hurts. It really does hurt, and more so. Game seven, too, yeah. in their place because it was all set up. I mean, we're up six. See, this is how well you know it because you read. People always say, God, you made so many great moments. It's not the great moments I relive. It's the hurtful ones that are on rewind in my brain. We're up six, that jump ball between Scotty Pippen and 7-4 Rick Smith, and it's on their side. If we win that jump ball, because it's on their side of the court. We win that jump ball, go down the score. We go up eight with, like, under four to go. You can start massaging the game by then. Yeah. They win the tip. Scotty wins the tip. The ball finds its way to Steve Kerr. He knocks down a three and from six to three, and it was like a snowball effect after that. We, it, we just couldn't hold on. And I just relived that moment over and over. If we could have won that jump ball and scored and just put more pressure on. Not to say we would have ended up winning, but it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. So, yeah, it's, it's the hurtful moments you remember more. Are you sure you're going to be emotionally ready to talk about this next Monday? Yes. I'm, it, it's good 
to, to talk it out, especially with family like yourself and my Danettes. It's good. It'll be good. Wait, what's your, glad, what's your wife think I'm about this, Rich? Get a sense, I'm glad people get a sense of how competitive things were in the 90s um, and the 80s, really, late 80s. But to have a camera and see him, see him going off and if, – if you people can understand, that's nothing. <laughs> that is absolutely nothing. What he was, how he's railing off on his teammates. That's nothing, guys. That is that's easy trash talk. If you could understand what goes on between games, oh my God, people, that is nothing. What you're seeing. Do you need an emotional support dog? I need something. I really do. It, it's good because you know I'm I'm sitting, I'm watching this with Mama Bear, and I tell her, go sit on the other side of the couch because <laughs> my, my palms are sweaty because – and then when the, the commercials come and she's looking at me and, you know, I got, like, sweat coming down, she's like, are you okay? I'm like, no, I'm not okay because it, it, it brings back those memories, good and bad. And uh, I'm excited about next week. Because I know he's going to kill me, but I'm going to take it as a badge because he's gone after everyone else in this docu series. So you might as well come after us. Um, you should wear so, your full uniform next Sunday. You know night. what? I'm going to try to. I have to have some uniform. I am. I'm going to take some pictures. Get your yes, Pauly, yes. Get your sweatbands and, uh, on and I am. Pull, full uni. Get, I never wore a headband as a player, <laughs> but if I can find a headband, I'm going to put a headband on. And I'm going to watch. I am going to watch this in full garb. Yes, I oh, will. Oh, that's good. Uh, hey, before I uh, let you go, Shaq says that uh, we shouldn't have a season because nobody's going to recognize this year's champion as a true champion. What do you make? Uh, I think they will definitely recognize it, but I do agree. I, I think we're getting to that point where we may need to just scrap this and, and start anew uh, next year. I, I just don't see any positive things coming out of restarting this. We're two months in now, right? Yeah. Uh, I think we'll get a lot of injuries once we come back because guys are going to try to – they won't train right. And you see a lot of these injuries at the start of the season because guys are not in shape. Um, I, I just don't see any benefit from it. Um, so I, I think if there, we do resume play and there is a champion – there won't be an asterisk behind it because it's still a championship, just like the lockout year when San Antonio won and Phil Jackson was saying there's going to be asterisks. No, you, you ended up winning the championship. You'll be recognized as that. But I do agree with him. We should start really looking at, at next season and just starting fresh. Well, you know, leave it to LeBron to win this year so then people have more of an argument that it doesn't really count as a championship. You know, with this whole Jordan phenomenon going on, it would just, it would be so LeBron-like to win and then have people hold it against him. And not only that, let's say they do scrap the season and we start again next year in October, November, December, or whenever they think about starting again. LeBron's a year older now, too. That's the only thing. And he didn't, he was having an MVP. He wasn't going to win the MVP. To me, that was Giannis. But he was 1A and 1B. He was going to be second in the MVP voting. All right. Just get ready. Like, gear up Sunday night like you're gearing up for a game. Um, uh, <laughs> what music did you listen to in the locker room before games? Tupac. Oh. I was a huge Tupac fan. So, All right. yes. All, right. All eyes on me. So, I'll probably be having that playing as I'm in full <laughs> pacer gear. And uh, it's ready to go. All eyes on me. <laughs> and a guard out of UCLA, six foot. Are you six seven or six six? Six seven. Six. Give me my inch. He was six six. I was six seven, <laughs> but it didn't matter. Oh, <laughs> uh, I can't wait. Uh, oh I'll, my god, I'll, y'all are gonna kill me next week, but it's gonna be so fun. It's going to be so fun. Thank you, Reg. I'll talk to you next Monday. Y'all the best. Oh, you man. Did. This is going to be so good. I hope Mike just tears him, just rips him up, laughs. Like if they show something that Reggie says about him where Mike gives you that big belly laugh like he did last night about Gary Payton. Yeah, Paul.
that story Reggie told is fascinating on so many levels that it's an exhibition game, a game that means absolutely nothing. And he talked a little smack to Jordan because Reggie had 10 and Jordan had six. Then Jordan ends up with 42 to 12 and says, don't ever try that with black Jesus. I know. I didn't know that he called himself black Jesus. Once again, we criticize LeBron James for being King James. He's calling himself Black Jesus. And somehow that's okay. LeBron calls himself King James. A dude calls himself Black Jesus. Take a break. Last call for phone calls. Back after this. people say on the street when they see you hey what's up wilmer valderrama <laughs> i love you on that 70s show and, 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 and i said no 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 I'm, dude i'm mario lopez <laughs> you guys yeah. got it all wrong yeah yeah watch me on access yeah. hollywood somebody or actually that. somebody actually said oh you're eric estrada i'm like oh no no so anybody latin they, do you play along with them Sure, or you I correct them, buddy. I sign it as Eric Estrada. Yeah, sure. Why, why not? Why, 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 you know, why ruin their dream? You know. I had people who were. Uh, I had a guy who came up to me and he goes, "Stuart Scott, love you, man." And and Stuart, of course, African American. Right. And I just said, "Yeah, booyah!" Yeah. Like I, you know, I've had somebody say, "Hey, hey Chris Berman." Oh, I, dude, um, Scott Van Pelt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, why not? Uh, is so. Is there a movie that they? couple you with when people come up to you where they want to ask you certain things about a certain movie i mean you know what it's been a cool transition because you know it started off with crash and then shooter world trade center like you know end of watch um you know uh, uh ant-man uh those kind of movies and so it's mainly movies about i mean maybe questions about that but i think i think ant-man gets the most questions because people are like those those fans are like they're they're diehard fans, and they really want to know everything Marvel, and I don't know everything Marvel. But when you were first pitched Ant-Man, right? Like, like what goes through, you know, Paul Rudd is, you know, I'm sure great to couple with, yeah. pair with, but, you know, when somebody says, here's the premise, and right. your reaction was? Awesome. Oh, I you mean, got it right but away. But the thing was, is that Marvel, like, Edgar Wright's the one that wrote me the, you know, the, wrote the part for me, um, and so someone from Marvel comes, and instead of you saying, like, give me the weekend to read it, the guy was standing outside of my hotel room while I was filming Fury, waiting for me to finish the script. And I'm a slow reader. So it took me like four hours uh, because there's so much description, you know, in those kind of movies. So, you know, I had to have an answer right away. So it took me, you know, an afternoon. And then I, I know that uh, the topic of another Ant-Man movie has come up, right? But I mean, just in mere form of question. Oh, okay. Where you're like, you know, if there's a third, would you want to be in it? And I was like, of course. And then Mike, and all of a sudden, I read in the headlines, <laughs> Michael Pena confirms there's a third movie. I, I, I'm like, I, I didn't say anything. Of Big fan. I'm sitting here with all my friends. We have a new Danimation. And I'm being told Mario does a great job in getting all this information and then sending it to our animator. And uh, this is the latest one that has uh, a, a nod to Michael Jordan. As an entertainer, sometimes you're able to pinpoint that moment, that moment where you think you want to do this for a living. Watching Dan that day, that was it for me. We've wanted that to happen for so long, and it finally worked out. Hour one, Michael Jordan right here in studio. The one we've been trying to get for years. I mean, more than a decade. Dan wasn't going to waste this shot. Well, you could tell Dan definitely wanted a piece of MJ. Piece of him? I wanted the whole damn thing. Yeah, we did it live on the show. It happened right here. Jordan's got the ball first. Dan slaps the floor and then goes for it. Dan steals the ball from MJ and spins. And then, like Mav and Top Gun, Dan hits the brakes, Jordan flies right by, and then, bang. Oh, man, drop the hammer. Dan Patrick dunking on Michael Jordan. I 
think that's where do you believe the miracles came from? Dan Duncan on Jordan, I had that post on my wall growing up. DP couldn't help himself. He had to step right over MJ and talk some smack. I couldn't believe that. You reach, I teach. I told Dan that before. And then he's going to use my line on Michael Jordan? Are you kidding me? You knew you were seeing something special, something you've never seen before, something you never see again. See again, see again, see again. What? No. 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 Damn it. It's, hey, it's a real, it's true. I'm, I'm sleeping in my glasses. Oh, good cameos there. Ooh. Did you turn off the heat? I didn't. Dylan, will you, uh... Coming up tomorrow, we'll talk to the Pac-12 Commissioner Larry Scott. Also, Sam Smith, who wrote The Jordan Rules, will join us coming up. Got a scoreboard winner, Ryan, in New York City. The numbers are 31-5. and five. All right, Todd, you want to give a hint on... Uh, sure. 30? Okay. Okay, the five has to do with uh, major frustration, one left. Major frustration, one left. All right. And the 31 is not Reggie Miller's jersey number. Okay. So uh, what I said for the clue is back up, Reggie. It's not about you today. Back up, Reggie. Okay. So maybe it's a backup. Could be. Okay. Paulie, this day in sports history might lead us to a clue or two. I wish I could help you. Uh, 1977, <laughs> Ted Turner managed an Atlanta Braves game. Okay. He was the owner of the team and decided to manage for a night, which... Okay. Imagine if someone did that now. All right. And then uh, 2015, the NFL announced that Tom Brady of the Patriots would be suspended without pay for the first four games. Uh, suspension for the violation of NFL policy on integrity of the game for his knowledge of underinflated footballs. After being checked by the officials. Still amazing. Story. Patriots would find a million dollars for taking a, a hint of air out of the footballs and forfeit a first round draft pick. So amazing. Unbelievable. Uh, so no hints there for Todd's scoreboard. <clears throat> All right. Let me hear it, Todd. All right. We went with five because major frustration is in winning all the majors except for the U.S. Open. He's got one left, as in his nickname, Lefty. And our guest today, oh. Phil Mickelson, has won five majors, and that was the number five. 31, wow. possible backup, his 31st birthday today. Mr. Cam Newton is 31 today, and he might have to be ready to take a backup quarterback role. Man, those are tough. It was a little tough. Yeah. Well done, Todd. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Uh, David in North Carolina. David, what do you have for me today? Hey, Dan. Uh, I, I got so many issues. Um, actually, uh, 5'11", 220 pre-COVID, 231 right now. Okay. Uh, your comment about Krzyzewski and du the Dukies getting away with all they've gotten away with on Zion Williamson – Oh, I don't know if they have. I don't, I don't, I'm not okay, saying fine. they have. I, I don't know, David. Okay, fine. I'm from Durham. Uh, I went to Chapel Hill, um, class of 83, so I was there when Michael was there. I know, I, you know, no, anyway, I hate those guys that say they know people. <laughs> anyway, uh, my problem is our football program and our basketball program was obliterated for five years based on nothing. The NCAA couldn't even press charges on it. And for you to – I love your show, love you, always have, but for you to sit there and just say, you know, that's no big deal. Hey, hey they, I, they no, 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 David, David, you got to understand, you're so close to it, and I am so removed from it. And if they nail Duke, nail Duke. I, I, it doesn't matter to me. 
I don't care if Carolina did it. If you get caught, you get punished. Okay. I, I love talking to Coach K. If Duke gets banged here, okay. Not the end of the world to me. I'm not saying let's, let, let's not cover this because it's Mike Krzyzewski. I mean, if that was the case, I wouldn't even bring it up today. But I can't sit here and go, boy, that would never happen. I can't say that. As much as I love Roy Williams, I, you can never say it won't happen. It happened to John Wooden. So I'm, I'm not naive here. You're upset because your basketball and football program got hit hard by the NCAA. Okay. If Duke gets hit by this with the Zion Williams, it's okay. Now, we'll move on. Thanks for the phone call. Decompress a little bit here. You're too close to it. Go Heels. Yes, McLovin. Has any team ever had more penalties and less wins in North Carolina football? <laughs> Not to pour salt on David's wounds. As you're going to. And also, they had like 10 first-round picks. And oh, I, I know. don't remember them ever being in a major bowl game. I know. Nice uniform. Yeah. You don't remember the heights that Mitch Trubisky lifted to them no, two, I do a couple not. years ago? No, I do not. Google it. No, do I? I do not. Uh, Dan in Chicago. Hi, Dan. Hey, Dan. A couple of things for you. Uh, one, if there were to be uh, an 11th episode of The Last Dance, I want it to be Chappelle's show, Rick James, Prince themed, where Dave Chappelle's Prince, <laughs> you got Red D telling the Black Jesus story, and just that's what I would want to see okay. with the 11th episode. Uh, <laughs> and then in, in regards to Shaq's comment, you know, I agree there shouldn't be a season, but that's out of health and safety. But, you know, when I look at, you know, the 99 Spurs, 2012 Heat, 2013 Blackhawks, strike short and champions that, you know, we're probably going to be champions anyway if there was a full season. 95 Braves, they were, uh, you know, over the 100-win the Indians in a strike shortened season. I mean, you know, the Redskins, I don't think... No, you're right, though, Dan. I mean, that those are all great points, and I appreciate you calling in. We, we don't hold... We're gonna, if, if the Lakers would win a title this year, just because it's LeBron, there would be an asterisk by this. Trust me when I say that. If, if Kawhi wins in the Clippers, it's not going to be an asterisk. If the Bucks win, it's not going to be an asterisk. If LeBron does, just because it's LeBron. That's all. But I appreciate that phone call. Nobody looks at the Spurs and goes, eh, strike short. In there. Or the Blackhawks. They just don't. But because it's LeBron and it's a talking point for shows, there'll be an asterisk by it. Yeah, Paul. And Dan, and vice versa, if the Lakers come up short in some type of like shortened playoff thing, they'll critique the Lakers and LeBron for saying, you had a shortened playoff where you had to win a fewer amount of games and you couldn't win that. Yeah. It, it's just, it's LeBron. It's, uh, it's open season for LeBron. And I don't want anybody to misconstrue what I'm saying about Zion Williamson. If Kansas has an assistant coach on record talking about uh, Zion's stepfather wanting benefits or wanting uh, money, whatever it is, and then he ends up at Duke, does he then go to Duke and then they don't ask for anything? You know, Cam Newton in Mississippi State. And remember there, what was the uh, 175 grand? Like... So then he he didn't take money when he went to Auburn? Or did they just hide it better? Like I, I just apply logic. And I know it's dangerous in this world that I work in. I just apply logic. And that is illogical. Oh, he's going to take money, but then he's not going to take money. Oh, okay. But just from Mississippi State, not from Auburn. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's go around the room. Uh, McLevin, I'll start with you. Uh, final results of the poll question. Does the documentary make Michael Jordan look less likable or more likable? 70% say more likable. Okay. Hey, it's a whole new audience that's consuming this. And I love that. I love that there's a whole new audience that's watching this. Because we tend to make these statements and we didn't see the player play. And I always say, see the player play, read about it as much as you can before you make an argument. And if you feel that way with Mike, great. I love it. More information, the better. Uh, what did you learn today, McLovin? I learned that Reggie says he doesn't care what Michael says about it. <laughs> We're going to find out next Monday. Fritzel. Uh, Phil Mickelson once caught a hard-thrown pass from Brady in Augusta when it was half dark out two weeks before the Masters, hoping not to break a finger. That was a good story. 
by Mickelson. Seton O'Connor. Phil Mickelson has a T-Rex in his office. Yeah. Hmm. Who doesn't? Paulie? Mickelson says, uh, 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 Peyton Manning, great trash talk. What we learned brought to you by LegalZoom. No matter what happens, you want to make sure your loved ones are taken care of. That's why LegalZoom's made it easy to set up the right estate plan without leaving your home. Take care of your family today with the right estate plan at LegalZoom.com. Thanks for the phone calls, emails, tweets, all around support. We'll do it again tomorrow. For Seton Paulie, Fritzie McLovin, yours truly, this has been the Dan Patrick Show.